It's Friday morning and you're welcome along to OTB AM. What a packed uh, weekend we have coming for you. It's been quite the week already for sport and our issue uh, over the next hour and a little bit really is uh, how to squeeze everything into such a t time frame. To, to that end, we decided we'd get in uh, sport's most loquacious broadcaster, Dave McIntyre. I'll, I'll take that intro yeah. as a first thing on a Friday further, morning. Further challenge ourselves for the <coughs> yeah. next hour. I can barely bit. pronounce the word loquacious, so given that that's been oh, attributed to me, I'm delighted. But, uh, <laughs> There's a Q in there somewhere. <laughs> welcome, Dave. Welcome to the studio. Yeah, thanks, for being. Uh I've been watching you in this new little corner you have over the last couple of weeks, and I've been thinking, it's, it's very cosy when there's two of them there. Surely there's no room for a third. And yet, Tommy well, has managed to. Um, it's the first. I sure off. hope that's the first time you've said that over the past couple of weeks. Um, I, I'm just looking forward to the Sky Sports commentary at the weekend, where uh, Dave's like, "This is quite a loquacious game, isn't it?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Install yeah. that into your, your challenge broadcast for the straight weekend, away. Is to, yeah, 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 Stroke yeah. that ball over the bar in quite a loquacious fashion. When you started off with, "I've been watching you," I really wasn't sure where that comment was going. No, like, neither so did I. I'm pretty pleased that. Don't that's worry. Where it ended purely up. professional capacity. Good morning, You're doing Joe. very well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, good morning to you. We have uh, <laughs> that's very formal. Uh, we've lots of good stuff uh, coming over the next little bit. Uh, so let's not delay too much. Here's a flavour of what's on the menu between now and uh, nine o'clock, or half nine, or ten o'clock, or whatever time it is that we eventually wrap up. But we're going to take you through what's going on across the uh, back pages in just a moment. Uh, needless to say, there's just one story from yesterday evening that uh, dominates all of that. Uh, the sports news, Darren Cleary, will be. It's a brand new feature this week, and. Uh, uh, it seems to be working so far, so we'll crack ahead and Darren will be with us uh, before 8 o'clock to bring you up to speed with what's happening in the world of live sport today. Uh, Jesse Barr is going to join us on the line and uh, one topic matter at hand there, that's the success of her uh, brother Thomas in Berlin yesterday. So uh, we'll pick through all of that with Jesse. We're going to preview the weekend of All-Ireland Football semi-finals in the company of the Carlo uh, coach Stephen Poacher and uh, Chris Kamara as well. I was in the studio during the week and I sat down with him to uh, chat all things football. John Giles, actually, was one of the most interesting topics and unexpected topics uh, that came up over the course of that conversation. That's all coming your way uh, around about nine o'clock uh, or thereabouts. But before all of that, it's time for the papers. OTB AM. Thanks to Screwfix.ie. Championing the trade with a dedicated call centre. All right, coming up on uh, 10 to 8 on this Friday morning. As I mentioned, there is really only one story that dominates the back page this morning. That is Thomas Barr in Berlin at the uh, European Championships yesterday and his run to bronze at the Olympic Stadium. It was a pretty sensational run, as it turned out. Uh, he was never really in the mix for uh, gold or silver, although he did say sort of in the interview afterwards that uh, he sort of flippantly threw away the comment at one point that actually, like, you know, if things had gone a little bit better, I might have, uh, I might have upgraded myself. Did, didn't feel like that was the sort of race that was in it that night, but uh, I mean the bronze medal was an exceptional achievement, really. It is. It's <clears throat> it's great for him to leave with something, and and no, I know he he didn't actually seem. We were more disappointed for him than he was with himself when he missed out on a medal at the Olympics, mm. and he did say afterwards that almost bizarrely, maybe had he finished on the podium, it might have been something that would have had come a little too soon for him, mm. and might have prevented him reaching his up, ultimate goal or reaching you know the best that he could be his optimum level. But to actually get a a medal now is it just must be such a feeling of personal satisfaction because four places it's nowhere really it's That's a killer <clears throat> and particularly okay. this European Championship so it is a downgrade in the Olympics yeah. if he f was to feel that he was going the right direction and his brilliant run in Rio wasn't just a flash in the pan he needed to medal here and he's obviously just a big race performer we all assumed one of the one of the three ahead of him at the Olympics was going to get pinged for doping, didn't we? And it was like, oh, we're going to get to celebrate this thing. Well, we may still, yeah, maybe well, 10 was, years down the line. That was a silver medalist yesterday, wasn't it? Uh, the fellow who beat him to, to bronze in Rio. And, like, it's not fourth place, really, in, in Rio, kind of... Like, I think that was just a fantastic achievement. I know we always kind of like to hold up the medal winners as the only people that have achieved something. Fourth place was magnificent in Rio. The real redemption for Thomas Barr last night, and it wasn't even redemption, was just making up for what happened last year when he was in such flying form. His profile was soaring high and he got sick. He couldn't compete in London. All his family were there and it was great to see all his family there in Berlin last night. I dare say there would have been a bar or two in the Berghain nightclub in Berlin last night celebrating that result. It was fantastic. It was like he needed to put in the season's best and he would have been the first person to admit that. From lane eight as well, let's not forget. Like, yeah, I mean, he, he says afterwards that he could see Warholm kind of closing in on him, going down to home straight, which 
must be a terrifying sight because that guy is absolutely outrageously good. Uh, but I, I guess that unbelievably game unbelievably good. Would you say on or just outrageous? Well, annoyingly good. He was like slapping his annoyingly face in the build up, and he was like giving it all that. And I was like, screw that guy. He's he's, he's a bit of an, an arrogance also. But then <laughs> later on in the night, when Leon Reed came out and was doing the exact same thing, I'm like, I'm proud to be Irish. <laughs> yeah, Go on, the cocky Irish. Irish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he, I mean, of all the places we had Kieran Cunningham in the studio last night, he was making the point that of all the athletes to be placed in lane eight, it actually suited him down to the ground because mm. he was always going to run his own uh, his own race. I saw David Matthews on Twitter saying that it was a bit. It should be. A, you should treat it as a time trial. Forget about everybody else and just go for your life. Which is up to me what he did. Yeah, it's easier said than done, though, isn't it? Because ah, you yeah. are looking at seven guys outside you. They're all in your peripheral vision, yeah. um, and you know that if you're if you're struggling, and you get a bad start in the outside lane, that it's just so hard to pull it back. But yeah. like his performance in the semi final wasn't great. It needed a massive improvement. Mm. But of all the people that we follow in terms of the top Irish sports stars in this country, he's the most likely to be able to come up with that performance because the occasion doesn't seem to get to him. He's very similar to Dervil O'Rourke in that regard. May not show much in the build-up to the big races. His problem is just making sure he gets into these finals. And you know when he gets there, he'll just perform. And he did it again last night. It was brilliant. And he's just so lovable. Mm. Like We just think he's great. Everything about him is great. And like you, you rarely hear that in the aftermath of a winning perform and a performance that wins a medal. Usually, it's like, oh, wasn't that a great semi-final performance where at least A or B didn't manage to qualify for the final of such and such? And Peter Collins and Cor, like, ah, oh, well, he's a great lad, but still, he's such a great lad that yeah. they that came into the conversation straight away last night in RT, which is completely fair game. And like you mentioned that there, like, where are we placing Thomas Barr in terms of our? clutch Irish athletes at the moment like you think of Dean Rock and his free kick against Mayo last year his two best performances were in the Rio, in Rio and winning the first ever male sprinting medal in the European Championships to me that's an unbelievably clutch performer he loves that full Olympic mm. stadium last Aishie night Aishie McFerrin must be up there when it comes to clutch yeah absolutely he reminds me of Harrington in a lot of ways Harrington will still say that <clears throat> his biggest problem is the first 60 odd holes of a golf tournament mm. but if he gets into contention going down the, the stretch on the Sunday he knows how to win yeah. and he generally wins when he gets into that position I always think that's a I, I heard golfer say that a lot I heard I actually interestingly enough I've heard Lowry say it even over the last sort of month or so and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the weekend but uh, that idea of if I could just get myself in contention like and generally it's the golfer who's struggling to make cuts that's saying that sort of stuff and I often wonder if it's a bit of self-talk to convince themselves that actually, if I was there, I would fly it. But like well, when Harrington says it, he's purpose. actually drawing on a pretty large sample size Fair of enough. exactly that situation. <laughs> yeah. Shane Larry's only won three times in, on the professional tour. Well, once as an amateur, obviously. But so I don't think maybe you, if he says it, you can quite take it as, as genuinely as what Harrington would. I mean, the Honda Classic four years ago but the golf he was playing prior to that was terrible mm. but he got into that position and he ends up winning and Thomas Barr did not run great in the semi-final but the final arrives he wakes up he says he felt nervous at the start of the day mm. but a more relaxed as the day went on and he just cruises into the into the into the stadium and you know he's going to deliver your encyclopedic capacity to pull sort of Irish sporting performances off the top of your head is always going to bury my argument there <laughs> so Appreciate apologies that. For From that. the sublime to the ridiculous on the back page of the end of the other story there, we might get into a bit more detail later on. Uh, Mourinho loses power battle as United opt against defensive signings. Uh, there's a lot in that. We'll come back to it in a little bit. Uh, the Irish Times this morning, Fowler defies the heat with blistering opening round is the uh, top story there. Our reflections on the PGA Championship. Uh, Woods shows all his uh, powers of recovery. Now, I know that... Uh, Thomas Barr does feature on the front page of the Irish Times uh, this morning as I hide myself behind the newspaper there. You can probably see the photograph of him there celebrating his win in Berlin. Uh, he doesn't feature at all on the front page of the Irish Times sports section. Uh, I mean, he is there because of fold. Maybe I shouldn't be too critical. He is there behind the fold with Ian O'Reardon, who's in Berlin, uh, reporting on that. But it's golf all the way in the front page of the Irish Times this morning. And a beaming Thomas Barr adorns the front page of the sports section of the Irish Examiner this morning after his 400 metre uh, success. The bronze medal there, brilliant bar, powers to bronze glory in the 400 metres final and also uh, Rosenberg's uh, win over Cork City features inside and uh, much more as well. That is the Irish Examiner this morning. Only you up, uh, Dave's up next. I'm up next, sorry. Well, it's, it's uh, no surprise that Thomas Barr. I was just thinking, is he, is he Waterford's greatest ever sportsman now? Oh. Has, has, he, has he put Tony oh. Brown and, He's gone and there. Uh, Stephen yeah, Hunt? John Tracy from Waterford. Well, if John was from Waterford, which I know I should know, but if he's a Waterford, sure well, given that he's he's medalled in Olympic Games, maybe the, maybe that just puts him John up there. John O'Shea. <coughs> Another good shout, yeah. We're, pre we're the, pre really compiling a top five here, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. The, the Mount the Rushmore, Rushmore for, for Waterford yeah. is really looking quite solid. And the man has to be up there as well. 
Yeah. Well, Milan, Dan Shanahan, Derek McGrath. Okay, we may, maybe Derek we need McGrath. ten. Seven hurlers, one hurling manager, and a couple of athletes. Well, maybe. Adrian always makes that point. It's like pick pick your five on the Mount Rushmore, and I'm like, no, there's four on the Mount Rushmore. <laughs> That's the you point. Be, the Mount Rushmore can be whatever you want it to be. <laughs> well, it's still it's a, if you're doing a new one, it's a fictitious Mount Rushmore. You can really put as many faces on there as you want. Let, I let's make a note to. I mean, you have to think about <laughs> Dublin's Mount Rushmore. Let's come back to that. In a little bit. That would want more a mountain range. Well, really, I'm just saying, that's exactly well, that's yeah. my point, Dave. I'm with you. With a series of peaks Shane and four or five faces hands. in each. Uh, I've got the Irish Daily Mail. Leap to glory. Bar makes Irish history with bronze in Berlin. So no surprise they're leading it. And Gary Neville, who was in Dublin yesterday, slamming the lack of Irish players at the top clubs in England at the moment. Your Dublin Mount Rushmore <coughs> would just be Podrick Harrington in 2007, Podrick Harrington in 2008, Podrick Harrington after the Honda Classic, <laughs> and Podrick Harrington when he said, if I could just get into contention. <laughs> Too many does that leave room for? No, that's the your Mount Rushmore done. <laughs> We're sorted out then. Gary Neville says <coughs> that no Irish, Welsh or Northern Irish players will get into that Manchester United squad at the minute. Aside from like Gareth Bale. Well, outside of the player they've been chasing for the last couple of years. <laughs> yeah. I'd say Aaron Ramsey might get into that United squad as well, but uh, look, that's another debate. Uh, the uh, Times Ireland quota system could lead to Irish revival. Neville says Premier League has neglected talent. Um, well, they've just cast the net far and wide, haven't they, over the last uh, decade or so, which makes it much harder for Irish players to break into these first-team squads. And United in £100 million move for Varane. I know we're going to be talking about Jose Mourinho and the, the, the power struggle that's going on at board level at Old Trafford at the moment, but I think that was a bit of a, a farcical attempt to try and prize Varane from the Bernabeu. It was never going to happen. <clears throat> and it is, of course, the uh, day opening day of the Premier League season. The more the merrier Red Devils can give miserable manager the perfect start. The new campaign kicks off tonight, 8 o'clock. Uh, Manchester United hosting Leicester City. What's yeah. on the front page of the Racing Post there, Dave? What's <clears throat> Koo Cash secures Melbourne hero for Magic Tilt at Cup. That, what's that all about? Well, I thought I'd, I'd give that to you. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Australian rider Corey Brown has only just arrived in Britain for tomorrow's Shergar Cup, which I know you knew was you've taking place. You're summarising here. Obviously. But uh, regardless of events at Ascot, he will not be flying home empty-handed after landing the Melbourne Cup ride aboard mm -hmm. Leading Hope Magic Surf. The Melbourne Cup this weekend. Uh, no, well, no, given that he's riding tomorrow in Ascot, no, no, like <coughs> November. All oh, right, yeah. Jesus, no racing fans in this studio at all. What, what, what's the, what cup is it? The Shergar Cup is at Ascot this Shergar year. Shergar Cup is yes. not even a thing I'd It'd be a bit of a trek now to get back home for the Melgan Cup inside <laughs> in, in time for Saturday or Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> um, the back page of the Mirror this morning is no more quick fixes. The new United policy, as frustrated Jose is told, to stop demanding overpriced older players and work with United's talented kids. The back page of the Sun this morning is window. Judas, Court Judas Courtois tells Aidan, join me. Uh, now, who's he been branded a traitor and a Judas by? Uh, Chelsea fans, that's the source here this morning. And Spurs failed to spend a penny, the first team ever to not uh, buy anybody in the summer transfer window since the transfer window opened. Uh, on a window basis in 2003. Uh, the back page of the Irish Daily Star is United Front, Jose Bax, Happy Pog. You've also got Thomas raising the bar there and Dublin on the merch, that's Owen Merchant. Uh, set to start, it seems, uh, for Dublin at the weekend. Um, he's had man marking jobs around McHugh and Al Sludden. And yeah, likely to keep experienced Michael Fitzsimons out of the team. We were discussing that with Mossy yesterday and uh, he wasn't sure which way Jim Gavin would go, but it seems there Kieran Cunningham is saying that Owen Merchant is going to start for Dublin this weekend. Finally, some uh, UK back pages. Divided United leads the way in the Daily Telegraph sports section. Mourinho targeting, uh, or the, the people that he's targeted haven't been deemed to be good enough as club ends deadline day empty-handed. And then it's Jose as well on the back page of The Guardian. Great detail in this story this morning by Daniel Taylor. He says that there was one phone call, just one, that occurred between Daniel Levy and Ed Woodward, but it was nothing to do with Toby Alderweirels. It was all to do with Spurs looking to make an approach for Anthony Martial. So uh, a power stroke as Dave mentioned at, at Manchester United. We'll get into the details of that story a little bit later on. Just want to show you the story in the New York Times this morning. Um, NFL National Anthem protests resume with players kneeling and raising fists. It's just around the corner again. Pre-season was back uh, last night, a full sl slate of games. So you had a couple of people uh, raising fists during the National Anthem, Malcolm Jenkins and Devante Busby. We'll show you this Malcolm Jenkins tweet, actually, uh, from last night. So... Uh, more than 60%, that's obviously to do with the people of colour in American prisons. The social injustice protests go on in the NFL, despite the fact that during the summer there was a directive issued that anybody, you will not be allowed to protest against the anthem. If you want to protest against the anthem, you've got to sit in the locker room. 
but uh, people on the pitch did indeed protest last night. For the Dolphins then, Kenny Stills and Albert Wilson took a knee during the anthem. Uh, Robert Quinn raised his fist and Colin Kaepernick put up this tweet then uh, to, this is Kenny Stills, continuing his protest of systemic oppression tonight by taking a knee. It's going to be interesting to see what the NFL reaction is to this. Just one interesting thing, which I don't think we talked about in the show in relation to Colin Kaepernick, is that uh, pro football talk, reported recently that electronic arts of course make the Madden game uh, deleted Kaepernick's name along with various profanities from the song Big Bank by YG which serves as a soundtrack to the video game uh, EA later claims the deletion was a miscommunication about the company's ability to reproduce Kaepernick's likeness in the game and the company vowed to restore the references to his name so if you think that the players are just going to walk onto the pitch and take a knee and uh, the NFL and certain political figures are just going to turn a blind eye to it well you do want to think twice it's only pre-season and there's going to be a lot more to this story you'd suspect over the next couple of weeks they saw the error of their ways. It was a user error as opposed to any director from the NFL to cut that guy's voice out of this thing. Purely accidental. It was uh, the, the fader went down when that name came up. Accidental, but incredibly coincidental. Coincidental the and accidental. NFL's yeah. insistence in trying to shut all of this stuff down has really backfired on them. It, it's the best thing that's happened to the to the protests uh, by the American players, whether it's taking a knee or whatever it is. Like yeah. The fact that the NFL have tried to shut it down is giving them more exposure than they could have dreamed of. Sure, but the, the most grim thing was obviously at the Dallas Cowboys when Jerry Jones' son said, anybody who's not respecting the anthem is going to be cut. So it's not just uh, the NFL. Like, the players themselves have said, oh, we'll pay the fine if they want to fine us for not uh, accepting the anthem during matches or whatever, before matches. Whereas the Cowboys are saying, you're done. If, if you're kneeling during the anthem, you're, you're going to get cut. So, Well, there was one of the owners, was it, was it the Cowboys? It was one of the owners recently, uh, whatever game was on, the last couple of, it might have been last week, was the anthem was on and this guy was standing there, uh, standing to attention while the anthem was on with his baseball cap on. And in the middle of it, one of his mates turns around and goes, uh, you better take the baseball cap off, clearly saying that to him. And he goes, nah, I'll nah, be absolutely fine, don't worry about it. So they're having a conversation in the middle of the anthem. He's got his baseball cap on, which in the US is, not, it's not quite, people don't really tend to do it that much here. In the US, it's a, you got to get the baseball cap off. So he's totally disrespecting the anthem, but yet saying that anybody who chooses to protest in a pretty respectful way uh, needs to pack their bags. It's, I don't know. Yeah. A uh, oh, bit of a head scratcher. It is interesting. It's also interesting to point out that the 49ers had no player kneeling during the anthem last night against the Cowboys. That's obviously Kaepernick's former team. They would have been one of the most uh, vocal in terms of support for him, but not a single player taking the knee. Not that you have to take the knee or anything. It's kind of undue political pressure, but just an observation. Yeah, you don't want to become like the poppy. Like it's, uh, you know. Well, like talking about November there a moment ago, Melbourne Cup and poppy. That's all <laughs> I'm thinking when I think November. <laughs> Right, just gone at 8 o'clock on this Friday morning. Lots of good stuff coming your way. We're going to be discussing the All-Ireland uh, football semi-finals upcoming with uh, Stephen Poacher. We're going to hear from Chris Kamara. We're going to get uh, Dave's thoughts on all of the uh, beginnings of the Premier League. He's excited. He's can't pumped. Wait. I mean, you are pumped. Juiced. Well, but not necessarily in a sort of it's a Too early in the morning to be pumped. Uh, so all that good stuff is coming. Jesse Barr as well on the way, very shortly to reflect on Thomas Barr's success in Berlin yesterday. Before all of that, Gary Neville's been speaking to Raf. Just being somebody who's a good teammate, a good person, uh, obviously a very good player. Um, and, you know, it was Roy who asked us to play uh, in the in the game. He asked me and Ryan in the summer when we was in the World Cup together and never give it a moment's thought. I think it's really important that um, all the players, you, know, you see the list that, you know, that's been put together and the players who are coming over to try and make sure that we do Liam justice um, because obviously it's tragic what's happened. Uh, and it's something that we you know, really need to make sure that we do the very best for him and come over and, 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 and give it our all. Yeah, and it'll be a great occasion as yeah. well. Um, obviously, I mentioned Dennis at the top there, uh, obviously a legend here. And you'd have seen him firsthand, eight out of ten performances at the very least yeah. every week. He was already at the club when you were coming through the youth ranks. Um, were you kind of looking at him as a kind of potential mentor as you were coming through, or was it somebody you're just kind of watching from apart, afar and maybe just picking out attributes you might just add to your own game? Uh, naively, because I played centre-back in the youth team I was watching a lot more of Bruce and Pallister in my first two years at the club but then in the third year when Jim Ryan as a reserve team manager moved me to fullback I definitely at that point then started walking, uh, watching Dennis and Paul Parker yeah. um, Dennis is the best fullback that I've um, ever seen ever played with uh, absolutely incredible like I say just consistency of performance sometimes people say oh 7 or 8 out of 10 it wasn't it was 9 and 10 out of 10 He's that good, you know. His, his, his delivery of passes into the front, his, his understanding of his position, his, his uh, supporting of the attack, um, 
his his ability to defend one on one, everything that you would need as a fullback, the, the ability to take a dead ball kick and free kick. Uh, it was absolutely brilliant player, um, and like I say, the best fullback that I've ever played with. So it was really a little bit later after mm. my first two years when I realised that maybe I wasn't going to play all the games at centre back that I really truly started to watch what he did, how he did it, uh, how he delivered his passes into the front. Yeah, that is uh, Gary Neville rather abruptly ending there with uh, chatting away about... Who was he chatting about? <laughs> was it Roy Keane? Dennis Irwin. Dennis Irwin. Dennis you, were, Irwin. you were tuned in. The Cork. <laughs> famous Cork footballer. <laughs> uh, it's what you come to expect on Friday morning, Dave. I know you're tuned in every morning sort of seeing what I'm saying. Monday to Thursday, would right, I Right, OK. No, listen, yeah. that's fair enough. That's a slight, but fair enough. <laughs> uh, Jesse Barr, good morning to you. Good morning. <laughs> How's it going? Um... I was much fresher when I spoke to you yesterday, I will be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, congratulations. It's really um, like a bit of a flavour of what's going on over here this morning. It's the Irish Times front page. Like it tends to be... Oh, uh, oh that's a brilliant picture. That's the Irish Times front page. It's the... All over the newspapers, the front page, yeah. Your mum is in the background there. That's who you're sort of uh, passing the yeah. information on. You can tell you're her that... Is that I'm, <laughs> front page uh, of the uh, Times Ireland as well. So, um, yeah, need to say a lot of coverage of... of <coughs> Thomas' success oh. last night. You were in the stadium watching it. We were, we were. There was a, a gang of us there. So it was myself, my boyfriend Paul, mum, a group of Thomas's friends from home, uh, his girlfriend. So we had a big contingency, um, and there was nothing but Irish. What the line has just broken up is a small bit there, so we might try and just re-establish that and uh, see if we can get back to Jesse Barr and family, as it turns out, in uh, in Berlin in the aftermath of that unbelievable success. Nice to see that. Obviously, they haven't seen the front pages yet. They probably wouldn't have a proper sense, really, of how it's kind of captured the imagination of a nation. Yeah, I'd say they're um, they're feeling a bit delicate this morning. You know, uh, bronze medals at major finals don't come around very often so what they do you have to take the opportunity and, and live it as much as you possibly can i'd love to uh, see what sort of shape thomas is in this morning and do the irish thing and go out and get pissed well he's racing in the relay at sort of midday or thereabouts so ah, he's loads of time to get, get <laughs> refreshed for that <laughs> uh, <laughs> applying your own sensibilities dave to an elite athlete is, uh, i'm gonna say well, like the, the post race interview today so why didn't that go so well for you i'm not gonna lie i'm absolutely yeah. dying doing the uh, the eddie pepper on it i'll be honest i was hung over <laughs> you know i didn't probably pr give my best self this afternoon no um it's yeah it's great hopefully we'll be able to, to re-establish that line soon just to, to hear kind of what berlin was like last night because as we said at the top of the show london obviously was disappointed because everybody was there but yeah. it really seemed that there was a lot of irish in Berlin last night, you could just about make out because, like, obviously uh, George Hamilton was talking kind of through the entire uh, introduction phase last night, so you couldn't really make out who was getting the loudest cheer. But for Thomas, you could kind of make out a noticeable elevation in the amplitude, right. let's just say, um, to, to to the reception of Thomas's bar, Tom Barr's name. So yeah, it's great. Like there was Did clearly you just have a lot of pop off George Hamilton there, by the way. Was that not not at all? Right. Because literally, he's educating us all on every athlete. And there just so happens to be cheering in the background. I want to know who the people that are that are up against. Uh, why would I be having a pop-off, George? No, Hamilton? I just thought you were saying that he was sort of talking all over things, but you were trying to soak up some of the atmosphere. No, he, well, he well, was speaking. <coughs> I was talking about the stadium announcer in the background, which yeah. we don't really need to hear. But as a commentator, Dave, you've got to work around the sort of local atmosphere. Obviously, that's part of your If you're trying to uh, get me to have a pop-off, George Hamilton, <laughs> <laughs> my hero, the institution that yeah. is George, you're barking up the wrong my tree, my hero is friend. that, Adrian. What, what are you going wow. for here? Wow, 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 wow. Um, yeah, so look, at fair enough. That's that's. I've been shot down again this morning. That's grand. Um, the Olympic Stadium in Berlin. We are trying to re-establish the line with Don't Jesse, worry. so we're just going to... We'll, we'll help you feel here, no problem. Time there. That's exactly what's going on. And it turns out to bring in you in, Dave, has been, turned out to be a genius <laughs> idea. Um, Did you watch the 200 metres afterwards? Because we don't want to blow all our 400 metre hurdle load on this, but when the good questions could be asked of somebody who actually knows a thing or two about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, so, you, like, the 200 metres, just to kind of touch on that for just a moment, was one of the <laughs> fastest races I've ever seen. In, especially in European right. athletics. It ran about 19 and a half, 20 seconds, was it? Yeah, so, like, when everybody saw, when everybody waved goodbye to, to Usain Bolt, it's like, ah, uh, slower races, it's going to be noticeably slower. And when you get to the Europeans, it's like, oh, well, this is definitely going to be a lot slower. Mm. And then you watch that last night and you're like, holy shit. And Leon Reed's, like, running a really good race last night. He was really disappointed afterwards. Mm. Based on his placement, he came seventh. But 
like that time. And what was it, the time? Can you remember? I can't remember the time. I'll probably get it if I uh, sift through the papers there. But it was it wasn't a season best, but it was close enough to a season best. Uh, and he was really disappointed. And you were just thinking to yourself, God, there was one hell of a mountain left to climb here to to try and get into the medals in two hundred meters in Europeans because that standard has shot up over the last two or three years. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of brought everything kind of back down to earth a little bit. But it also kind of puts it, it illuminates Thomas Barr's achievement even further, doesn't it? It's like this is the standard that we have in European sprinting at the moment. Mm. Um, it's going to be very interesting as well to see how Barr does when he gets to an international level or a world level next year as well with World Championships because just chatting to him before he went to Berlin, he says that the the world's, the world leader at the moment is a guy called Samba from Qatar who's one of this one of these signings that the Middle Eastern uh, nations have made. Uh, so he's a, he's a name to watch out for when we go to the Worlds next year. Yeah, like the context of this entire thing, like it's the 84-year history of the championship, something like that, and it's the first time an Irish man has medalled at it. Uh, which is an incredible sprinting, yeah. uh, sprinting uh, an incredible feat given some of the sprinters that we've had uh, over the years. Like David Gillick, obviously, is the guy who's doing the interview afterwards. And I was just looking it up before we came in. Obviously, the European indoor goals, sixth at the Worlds, fifth at the Europeans, um, and there was there was a couple of others we kept. We'd come close in a, I think, a four hundred meter. Hessian, I'd point. say, would have been I, a, a uh, good shot as well. Hessian, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, incredibly difficult, and I, I think you need. You need the flag bearers like Tom Barr. What we did at underage level at the Europeans a couple of weeks ago was brilliant. Mm. And it's just evidence of the brilliant work that's been done at grassroots level through the athletics club around, around the country. But you do need a, a figurehead. And Tom Barr is the kind of guy that you want for that because that inspires people that, yes, they would have seen what the girls achieved at the Europeans in the last month. But if they see what he's doing on the biggest stage, well, that just gives you an even more encouragement to kind of get back out there, get the spikes back on and, and, and try and replicate what he's doing. Because an Irish guy winning a medal in a sprint, a vinyl at a major event, is it's, I don't think you can under, understate it. A lot of people today will be thinking third place, bronze medal, so what? Mm. But we can't actually uh, overstate enough what it takes to put yourself in that kind of level. Obviously, Worlds is another step up, Olympics another step up again, but he's already shown that he can go very close to the Olympics. Yeah. Ah, yeah, look, it's an incredible feat. And he's, you know, he talks about afterwards, but sort of almost the vindication he's had injury issues over the last year thereabouts as well. And, uh, like, hard work doesn't always result in success is the other thing. Like, it tends to be, you always hear this nonsense that drives me bonkers at the end of any sort of sports where a team has won and they say, well, this is the reward for all the hard work you put in, or... People work hard all the time, yeah. like really hard, like and not always in sort of eighty thousand seater stadiums. And uh, they work incredibly hard, and they don't always get those sort of results. So, um, well, more so maybe than any other sport, <clears throat> sprinting and athletics in general, you require a huge amount of luck because mm. because your windows for the major events are so small. Mm. There's a very good chance you're going to be hurt when that event comes along, or ill, which is even worse luck as Thomas Barr, a Sonia experience in Atlanta in 1996, because you're only looking at two days out of your year. And you've got to hope that that's near, near your career peak. Uh, we've re-established yeah. Jesse Barr, actually. There was, uh, a, there was a storm, Jesse, I believe, in, in Berlin last night in every regard. Yeah, yeah. I'd literally, as soon as the athletics finished last night, there was a massive thunder and lightning storm, and it's affected all Wi-Fi, 4 and 4G, 3G over here, so I apologise for that. Oh, that's an absolute fine. Dave, in the meantime, while the line was down, has been uh, suggesting that uh, Tom, I mean, yourself was fair enough, but that Tom was out in the lash last night, <laughs> um, which, we've, which we've told him uh, it was definitely not the case. But what, well, how we you... don't know for, cer for cer <laughs> certain. Jesse will have to Jesse confirm that. Right. How, how did you celebrate? Did not come with us. He would be running that relay this morning. He, <laughs> he was very tempted. If his coach hadn't whisked him away, I'm sure he would have been with us. <laughs> So we were just chatting. You were, you were, you guys were in the stadium last night. Whereabouts were you in relation to the finish line? We were right on the. St actually, we were right above the start. Right. You know, so we were on the top bend or on the first bend. So we were there when he crossed over the line and kind of came running towards the screen. But we were right up in the gods, um, and we may have gotten in a little bit of trouble with German security bursting through to try and get down to him to hug him. Um, German security over here are very strict and they were not happy about us <laughs> deciding we want to go and hug him um, so yeah we, were, we weren't kind of on the edge that we could go and hug him and throw him the flag but we were waving from above, he knew where we were he had spotted us from the start So, so are you watching on the, on the big screens Jesse when he's coming over the line? You actually had to because he was running right towards us so it was very hard to judge exactly where he was and obviously with that French guy being right beside him 
it was neck and neck. So we were kind of looking to the track, looking to the screen, looking to the track and screaming. Like we we're all quite hoarse this morning and I realized we did so much shouting at him. You're probably like he, he had spoken yesterday a little bit about sort of the nerves that he had during the day. And then by the time the evening came around, he became that guy that we were used to looking at in Rio, obviously, in terms of that sort of relaxed nature. And he's waving probably up at you guys and he's smiling mm. away. Um, it seemed like talking himself into that zone almost was was the thing that resulted in the outcome last night. Yeah, well, we were all we were all very nervous for him because we'd met him. Obviously, I'd, like I'd said, we had met him yesterday or the day before yesterday, and he did seem a bit nervous, a bit tense, which is unusual for Thomas because I think this was this was the real pressure race for him. I mean, Rio, everything was a bonus, um, and obviously with London not going well, this was this was the race that was really the pressure, and he was really very aware of it. And I think he woke up feeling nervous, but he said to us after the race, he said by the time it got to the afternoon, he was raring to go, and he just wants to go and run that race. Um, so and obviously for to us he was a speck, um, we couldn't see him. Um, we couldn't see him very clearly. We couldn't see what his face was doing. You could see when he waved, so it was very hard to see. But our dad is at home, and he rang and said no. He was bouncing down the track. You could tell he was he was raring to go as well. So yeah, it was a bit surreal still to think that like we're going to be watching him on a podium later. But I mean, it's been a long time coming. Absolutely. We also had the added bonus, Jesse, of course, of seeing France fall into fourth and Ireland beating France in some sort of revenge for Thierry Henry is how I'm putting this, finally, at long last. Um, you, you mentioned on the show yesterday that he's a championship performer and yesterday just proved that through and through and it's almost as if career-wise now he's in a perfect place because people around the world are going to be looking at this guy who's put in his two best ever performances in his two biggest ever races, potentially, and now the sky's the limit. Yeah, well, I mean... I would say every single one of them had him written off yesterday after mm. his run in the final. And what we had to say to him was like, once you're in that final, it's a blank slate. It's a clean slate. The semi-final times don't matter. Where you are in lane-wise doesn't matter. And he does always rise to the occasion. Now, I'm delighted he did because I was watching back that clip you put on Twitter yesterday. And I was going, oh my God, if he doesn't rise to the occasion now, like I've said it, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> but he did and I, I had no doubt he really does he he really relishes and he thrives on that kind of environment he really does and you can see it it was interesting to listen to him afterwards he uh one comment that stood out for me in the interview he did with david gillick and rt afterwards just about uh if things had gone slightly better i might have had an upgrade of a medal i mean it's, i don't know how many times maybe you haven't at all had a chance to look back at it but with your eye on it and given your own expertise in the area was there aspects of the race that you thought he might have managed differently or how would he have um, yeah, necessarily pushed himself up, up the rankings a bit? Yeah, so we haven't seen obviously the interviews on RT or anything so I don't really know what he said in those post-race interviews but my the only thing that worried us is because he, because he was in that lane 8, I've been in lane 8 before at Europeans and you're very much like the, the hare to the greyhounds so you kind of run, end up running scared so I feel that he ran his first 200 much faster because usually He's back in sixth or seventh in that first 200. He goes out a lot slower. And he was right up with them um, in the first two. So I was going, has he has he done too much in his first 200? Is he going to have the legs left the last 50 that he usually does? And that was my only worry, you know. But I think when the French guy came up on his shoulder, all was probably going through his head is, I'm not getting fourth again. So I don't, I don't, I don't think anything was going to stop him getting that medal. Jesse, it's Dave here. Does Thomas, does he strive, you know, uh, is there a desire to achieve a level of consistency in, in his maybe more regular races, race meets like the Diamond League, etc., the Grand Prix? Or is he satisfied that he is the kind of an athlete that just gets that little bit of an extra buzz when he knows the stakes are at their highest? Is it something that he wants to change or is he perfectly happy being the guy that steps up when it's absolutely necessary? And you've already talked about this race being where the pressure was at its greatest, given what happened in London and him looking to build on what happened in Rio. Yeah, I suppose I can't really answer for Thomas on, on his like what, what he would think on that. I don't think he's ever going to be happy. He doesn't want to be the guy who just performs the championships. Obviously, you want to be the performer. You want to be the person that someone fears every time you step on the track. I think he is. Um, I just don't know. Is it just that championship environment that just brings out that extra little edge? And having, you know what it is? I think it's having all the Irish in the stadium all the time, which don't you don't tend to have at the Diamond Leagues. Because like his best, some of his best races have been at like the Morton Games in Dublin. I think he really, he really thrives on having all the support and those Irish flags and people cheering for him and there was an awful lot of that yesterday 
and maybe that's it now. Obviously, I can't answer for him. I'm hoping he's somewhere listening to this, agreeing with me, <laughs> or going, shut up, Desi, what are you talking about? But I do feel that he he really runs on that extra support. So everyone start, should start booking their uh, plane tickets to Tokyo now. <laughs> Is it a, uh, does it help him in some ways, though, that you know if you produce the kind of semi-final performance that just does enough to get you into the final, and if you haven't been delivering a consistent set of times in the build-up to a major championship, when you are at that starting block, the guys inside and outside you are obviously they were only in one direction with Thomas been in the outside lane yesterday. They maybe don't rate you. They maybe underestimate you a little, and that could cost them when it comes to those really close finishes that Thomas is uh, regularly involved in in these types of races. Yeah, I well, I said it. I, that was the first thing I said in that semi-final. I said, Thomas, they're going to all have written you off. You know, when we were talking about it yesterday, I said he was written off by all those other guys. He was out in lane eight. He ran a, a subpar semi-final, scraped, uh, scraped in by the skin of his teeth. And I'd say a lot of them were kind of going, well, he's not a threat anymore. And that's a lovely position to be in. And that's when he does his best, when he's the underdog. So I think we were kind of saying it, okay, we're nervous, but maybe it was a blessing in disguise. And it clearly was because he just ran his own race and no one is really thinking about him. Is it that I sort of... That uh, Irish chip on the shoulder type thing, Jesse, is that what you're saying? That sort of, listen, everyone's out to get me here and they're under, under, uh, underrating me. Is that that's what we're talking about? No, I, don't, I, don't, I really don't think he has that. I think Thomas, Thomas doesn't step on a track and think everyone, no one's rating me. He doesn't really think about the other races as far as I'm concerned. You know, we were talking about Warholm and kind of warning him that, look, he's going to be on your shoulder on the back straight. I mean, he don't be prepared for that. And he was kind of going, yeah, yeah. He has his own race plan and he's yeah. running that. And to be honest, anything that's going around him, around him, he's very focused, much better yeah. than I ever was. Yeah, he did mention that all right afterwards that he was prepared for the idea that uh, the Norwegian was going to come up on his shoulder and it wasn't going to phase him too much. Just one yeah. thing before we uh, before we wrap, just just on the, the he's, he has mentioned a couple of times the uh, coaches and the work he's been doing with them and the effort that's mm -hmm. been put in. As he's obviously come back from injury over the last while. Is there anything he's doing differently uh, differently in that regard than he would have been doing previously? Um, well, to be honest, I haven't been training with them this year, um, so I, I don't know exactly what he's been doing. I think it's consistency for Thomas. He's been in the gym and he's gotten much, now, he doesn't look it, but he's gotten much stronger um, than he ever was in the gym. I mean, he's lifting weights that he shouldn't be lifting for the size of his skinny little arms and legs. Um, so I think his strength is really there in that shows, and I think it's just consistency. We're going to have a new track in UL, which was badly needed so I think the injury risk is definitely going to have dropped a good bit and I think Haley and Drew whatever they've done with him our coaches then in Limerick they're really good at getting him for peaking for championships what they did before that I'm not really sure um I think whatever the injury woes were he's managing them now better than he was um but yeah I think it's just a lot of consistency now finally backed up I've never understood why athletes lift weights I have to say Oh, we love it. <laughs> is it just? Is it like it's just an aesthetic thing? Is it? Is that the? <laughs> no, it's, it's very much what? an injury. It's a strength. It's an injury. Yeah. Um, I would say none of it's upper body. If you see us every day is leg day. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Well, listen, I know it takes the heat off and you can probably relax and enjoy the, the relay, obviously, but maybe later on today as well. Uh, well done. Yeah. Congrats to the entire family. Congrats to, to uh, Thomas. You can pass those on for us and I'm no doubt we'll catch up with you again soon. Thanks a million, Jesse. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jesse Barr, live on the line there from Berlin. What was outrageous about that? Power, well, Power is very important. This is where do you think the strength and the explosiveness comes from if you're not lifting Your weights? Legs. You put, if you look at a 100 metre sprinter, I mean, their arms are nearly as big no, as their yeah, legs. I, I, totally. I don't understand why. Because that, it's a full body. I, mean, I do kind of understand why. I just Power dynamic that needs to be going on there. Your arms are pumping. Your overall explosive strength has to be there. I mean, you could also say, why would a footballer ever lift weights? Why would a Gaelic well, footballer ever lift a weights? A Gaelic footballer, because there's a physicality involved. You would require the sort of being able to shoulder somebody. What about, what about your start? What about the launch you give yourself out, out of the starting blocks? I, I, without understanding fully the technical uh, aspect of it, I'm presuming that most of that has come from your legs. They've most of it, but not all. Yeah. It has to be a full body thing. You don't need to look like Arnold Schwarze <coughs> Schwarzenegger is what I'm saying. They don't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Some of those 100 metre sprinters on. Come on. But that's the 100 metre sprinter is quite different to the body shape of the 400 metre hurdlers. Well, it's the 100 metres I'm trying to have a pop off here. I mean... Okay, so every 100 meter sprinter who lifts the weights, that's purely for the look. But for the 400 meter sprinters, no, not quite. So, if, so you're saying if, if Usain Bolt just tone down a little bit, like you saying, listen, tone down a little bit. No, I'm just saying he doesn't need to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But he doesn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. A lot of those 100 meter sprinters. Arnold Schwarzenegger is.
top heavy, he's uh, extortionately huge. Um, whereas Usain Bolt is all kind of, uh, I don't want to use Usain Bolt as an example, but 100 meter sprinters, it's all kind of proportional, no? Justin Gatlin, you think that's a... Is, let's, is, not, let's not use Bolt and Gatlin as uh, examples here. The Keith Andrews Show, uh, let's sort of move on away from that one. <laughs> the Keith Andrews Show uh, returned to Off the Ball yesterday afternoon, the first uh, show of the brand new season, which gets underway tonight. It'll be live across Off the Ball channels every Thursday from half past t- uh, 12. And Keith's got a pretty cool uh, rotating panel of contributors as well that'll be with him every week. Uh, you can also watch it back afterwards or listen to it on the podcast on offtheball.com right now if you wish or maybe wait until after this show. Uh, here's Keith from yesterday's show. He had Stephen Kelly in studio on the difference uh, in playing against Frank Lampard and Stephen Gerrard. I found Gerrard harder to mark because he would make the run less. I think with a midfielder he's actually got one with him Bryson plays midfield. Yeah, very good. He makes that run time, time, time again. So you know he's coming. And Frank Lampard was the same. You know, as the play's building up down that side of the pitch, I'm not taking my eyes off yeah, you, Paul, yeah. because yeah, you, I know you're, you're gone. Not be there. I know you're gone. There was only one time, I'm with you, I have utmost respect for him. There was one time we were losing at Stamford Bridge, which we normally did, whatever team I played in, and he was doing keepy ups when they were about 4 0 up okay. on the halfway line. And I ran yeah. about 30 yards to try and have him. And he gave the ball away and I just missed him. Mm. And then to be fair, I was going crazy at him because I thought it was disrespectful. Yeah. And he actually apologised and said, yeah, yeah, sorry, bro. Because that's not really like, I wouldn't associate no, yeah. him with that kind of no, nonsense. No, exactly. Yeah, you wouldn't have exactly. put that the penny yeah. drop, yeah, yeah, I shouldn't be doing that. I'm yeah. taking yeah. the piss here a little yeah, yeah. bit. Yeah. But it was, like the way he played, it was a statistical inevitability. He was going to get in the end of something. Yeah. Because of it, if you do so much, you're going to, I mean... Mm. He was 20 goals a season. No, five centre midfield. Chelsea's he, he, all-time top scorer. It's ridiculous. <laughs> scoring, scoring that many goals from midfield, and he did it was it five or six years in a row, which was unheard of. Oh, yeah. If you had a centre forward that did that now, how yeah. much would they be worth? Yeah. I mean, it's no reflection on us, right? But that was a studio of handsome men. <laughs> <laughs> what this or that? John Malloy, Stephen Kelly, and Keith Andrews. There's a lot of ginger in this studio. There is. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm deeply offended by a, a slight on That's what I was hoping for, Owen, but uh, thanks for taking the bait. Darren Cleary is uh, along with us. Morning to you, Darren. Morning, Adrian. As you've been discussing, Thomas Barr ended an 84-year wait to win a medal in a sprint event for Ireland at the European Championships yesterday. Barr came agonisingly close to doing that when an Olympic bronze in Rio two years ago. He just missed out. He came fourth, but he went one better this time to finally land a podium position at a major championship. Barr crossed the line third in the 400 metres hurdles final in a time of 48.31 seconds, his second fastest time ever. It's a victory so sweet for Barr, he joked, he might even call it quits now. Ah, unbelievable, I can quit now, I'm done. <laughs> no, it's, it's unbelievable, like it's been a long time coming, like especially even the year that I had last year, you know, we've been talking about a medal, everyone has been talking about medal all, all the way through the year, and I knew Capello and Warholm were up there for the, like, they, they were the favourites by a long shot, but I knew after that it was a fight for third place, and if I, everything had gone well, I could have been up there into another medal position, but to be coming home in, in a field like an Irish or not Irish international hurdling at the moment is in ridiculous stead you know people are running 47 just for fun so to be up there you know and have run one of the fastest races of my life when it counts is just uh, amazing so a huge thanks to everyone that has been supporting me all the way through the year my, my friends family uh, coaches Meanwhile, Rory McIlroy has played down an injury scare after opening the PGA Championship with a level par round of 70. McIlroy was seen sporting an anti-inflammatory patch strapped to his forearm. That was to help alleviate tightness in the muscle. Now, the world number five did admit that he felt the problem over the weekend of the WGC Bridgestone Invitational, but he insisted it did not affect his swing. He will resume from level par. Shane Lowry goes into the second round of the tournament as the leading Irishman. The Offaly man will tee off from one under par following the opening round of 69 in St. Louis yesterday. Well, Potter Carrington is one over. Paul Dunn two shots further back. Gary Woodland, the man to catch after round one. He's a one-shot lead on six under. Tyrone have made one change to their team for Sunday's All-Ireland Senior Football Championship final. That's against Monaghan at Crow Park. Rory Brennan has been drafted in at cornerback. Connor Myler, the player to make way, having been injured in last week's win over Donegal and Bally Buffet. Well, Cork City find themselves on the brink of elimination from the Europa League. John Caulfield's charges will have to try and overturn a two-goal deficit against Rosenberg. A first-half brace from Jonathan LaVey has left the Norwegian champions in complete control of the tie. Well, Jose Mourinho insists that there is no unrest at Manchester 
Manchester United after the club failed to sign a central defender on deadline day. United made an unsuccessful attempt to sign Diego Godin from Atletico Madrid just hours before the window closed. Potential moves for Harry Maguire, Toby Alderweireld, Jerome Boateng and Jeremy Yamina failed to materialise. What Mourinho said, one lie repeated 1,000 times is still a lie, but the perception of the people is that it's true, but it is still a lie. So I won't repeat my players, we are very happy. United kicked out the season later on against Leicester City. Jose Mourinho unbeaten in nine opening weekend matches, while the Foxes have lost in their last seven visits to the Red Devils. That game begins at 8 o'clock. While Santi Gazorla looks to end a two-year absence from the game, he has found a new club and his move is making headlines, not for the reasons he would have liked, I'm sure. The official unveiling might be one of the strangest stunts we've ever seen produced by a football club. It involved a magician massaging a... I, I don't know what you call it, a big therapy chamber, a big plastic tube full of smoke. And in that big plastic tube full of smoke, the grand unveiling will come any moment now. Well, that's bizarre. But I'm just waiting for, for Santi. <laughs> <laughs> we all our own. That's a... uh, well, well, magia. what does that mean? Welcome, mm. Santi, or here's well, the like... magic. <laughs> Something magic. Um, is it, uh, it will be very funny if this didn't happen. No, it, it, it's unbelievable. You're watching it. It happened. There's like a David Blaine stunt. It is definitely the weirdest transfer unveiling I video I've ever seen. It's like the two-pack hologram. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Santi Gazorla. Oh. You're the only man to ever compare Santi Gazorla to Tupac. No one will ever do that. Oh, ever it's actually again. him. Oh, right. I thought it was actually a hologram. <laughs> no, no, it's really him. <laughs> That was Sandy Gazorla. Unbelievable. That is your sports news. For more, offtheball.com is where you'll keep up to date with all of the day's sports news. Thanks, uh, new, uh, sports news guy, Darren. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, right, lots of... Uh, <laughs> I mean, that was the caption, so that's what we got to roll with. Uh, lots more to come. We're going to be hearing from Chris Kamara before uh, we wrap up. But next up, it's time to preview the weekend of All-Ireland Senior Football semi-finals. We're going to talk to uh, Stephen Poacher in just a second. But before that, uh, we were at the Roisin Dove in uh, Galway last night with thanks to our GEA partners, Boyle Sports. Uh, it was an off-the-ball roadshow. We had an amazing cast of guests there. Amongst them uh, was Ryan McManaman, who had this classic... It was Rory McMahon and played, so I can't say that. Interesting. <laughs> you were that afraid of Mickey? You, you were 9 10 under 14. Well, I would, te- I would say no. I've, Mickey said to me one day now, he goes, and this is maybe after us to have been with one, maybe two on irons, and I was in the physio room one day, and I must have been chatting to me, he goes, Are you taking any teams this weather? And I says, God, I, right, Mickey, I'm taking me on the 14s. Next thing he starts staring at me, and he kept going. Are you taking on the 14s? I says, oh, jeez, I'm a kid. I goes, right, how's that going? And he says, are you doing a thing fair? I said, jeez, I'm a kid. <laughs> and that guy turned around to me and goes, and there's no overage. <laughs> I had totally forgotten about this incident. And I says, why do you ask? He goes, because you played overage against me when I was managing Eric O'Keefe on the 14s. And I says, I did it. And he goes, you bit me. So that man, that man took that and he still, every time I do chat to him, he, he does still bring it up. But it was, it was all maybe like, allegedly, like, you know, because. <laughs> Yeah, Ryan McManaman there at uh, the Rushing Dove in Galway last night. Uh, there was a cast of thousands there. Ray Silk, Pat Comer, uh, David Brady. David Collins. Brady. I mean, that was sort of, you know, chief amongst it. Banty uh, was obviously there as well, and uh, they previewed the weekend of football. So that's uh, all available up on offtheball.com. You can check it out there. Uh, Mel, well, Mel on Facebook says that... Uh, I mean, Mel, well, Mel, I'm going to say, she is enjoying Off The Ball Live and all the conversations and the impromptu chat, as she puts it, that develops. But can I ask the panel, when is anyone at the panel going to declare that this Dublin team from 2013 to present is the best GEA senior football team in the history of the game? Uh, For once appreciate the balance of superb football skills alongside the physicality of this team that is supposed to be the template of Gaelic football. And if Johnny Cooper doesn't win football of the year, I'll eat my shorts. Well, there'll be a lot of short consumption, I'd imagine, come the end of the year. I would suspect that. Uh, yeah, I'd get the pastry bake going because you need. You're going to have to soften that up a bit. A bit of ketchup. <laughs> Brian, Brian Fenton will come with his All Star award in one hand and a, a little tub of ketchup in the other, so that you can eat your shorts with it. I anyway, think John, Johnny's not even in the conversation for football of the year. That's not not that he's not having a very good championship, but I haven't heard his name being mentioned as one of the contenders. We should ask a judge. 
uh, about who's in the conversation. Yeah, <clears throat> the annual conversation with Dave about sort of lifting the veil of the All-Star conversation. To which I always reply that we merely come up with the three nominees. Yeah. The players themselves pick the Footballer of the Year. Um, the conversation about Dublin being the greatest, potentially the greatest team of all time, happens all the time. Like, you can't continue to have only that conversation. And I mean, I don't know if that's the source of how most dubs feel slighted by the lack of respect that they get as a team. <laughs> but you can't continue to go, like, it's as clear as the nose in your face that that's exactly the direction they're headed, is being the greatest Gaelic football team of all time. Yeah, unless somebody beats them this year and then next year they could re maybe reclaim that. Like, at the moment, they're either second or third greatest team of all time, either... <laughs> either joint... <laughs> well, well, it's obviously, you know, who's, who's ahead, Dave. So. Well, no, I, like, I mean, it, yeah, obviously, the, the great Kerry team is the number one team of all time. There's no question about that. That's not even up for Listen, debate. Listen, Emma Fitzmaurice doesn't agree to do these sort of interviews but with hold on, hold on a minute. That's the, you've, got, you've got to bag uh, the Kerry drum Mike, for No, my, my question here is, are, are this Dublin team better than the great Wexford team that won four in a row? <laughs> That's where they're at at the moment. They haven't won four in a row yet. Oh, uh, you drew that line in mean, with such conviction and... Well, well done, and I, and I admire you. <laughs> well I admire done. you in that way. Couldn't be any more patronising. So patronising. <laughs> Carlo, coach Stephen Poacher, Good morning to you. Hi, nice, thanks, lads. Is this? Uh, we've just been discussing uh, the greatness of Dublin here. Um, in the context of this year, is it? Is there any point in previewing this stuff? Is it just ultimately a, a procession to a Dublin, uh, another Dublin win? No, I, I don't feel so. No, I think now this Saturday, um, obviously, I, I do feel they'll beat Galway. Um, I think Galway will be in a bit of a downer from last weekend. Uh, but, uh, no, I think, lads, that, that the two teams on Sunday are two very interesting setups, you know, and I feel that both of them are equipped to give Dublin a serious challenge and a serious test. Now, I'm not saying that Galway won't. I think they will as well. Uh, but I think the biggest challenge for, for Galway will be to lift themselves after last weekend because they were extremely flat and... and extremely below par against uh, Monaghan, which was surprising, you know. Yeah, they sort of fell between two stools almost. They didn't kind of rest a bunch of players and take it easy in preparation for the Dublin game. They sort of half went for it and then obviously fell significantly short. Not the most ideal preparation for playing. What we're discussing is maybe one of the, the greatest football teams of all time. Oh, listen, there's no shadow of a doubt they're a fantastic team, um, you know, full of athleticism, full of flair, full of power, pace, you know, and... Even their bench as well, it's scary, you know, and we've, I've, I've talked to a few people about this and you can imagine, you know, your best defender, for example, maybe marking a, a Dean Rock or marking a Paul Mannion for, for 50 minutes who's running you into the ground and then all of a sudden McManaman comes to the bench or and I see Brogan's back in the picture now and, you know, it's, it's their bench is something phenomenal and I suppose that Tyrone are probably the only side in the country this year to really match their bench as such, you know, which is, which is interesting. Stephen, they haven't really got out of second gear this year. They've just done what was required, particularly against Tyrone, where they kind of took the foot off the pedal in the last 10 minutes. In your experience as a coach, is it easy to find that third, fourth or fifth gear when required? Or if you haven't been in a position where it's been asked of you for the first eight months of the season, you might actually be found wanting when it comes to the crunch. Are, are we just so confident in this Dublin team that we believe it will happen? Well, I suppose, you know, over the last couple of years in, in the finals, Mayo have, have obviously, you know, taken them to the, the, the pin of their collar a few times and they've, they've responded and they've found a way to win, you know. And look, it is, it is, I suppose, as you say, I suppose in Leinster it was it was a cakewalk for them, you know, and there was no challenge put to them at all. And, you know, and then obviously then you, you look at the Super 8s and bar the Tyrone game, as you say, the last 10 minutes where Tyrone mounted a bit of a fight back. But look, I, I thought Tyrone at stages in Omer were unlucky against them. I thought Tyrone were caught a lot of times on the counter-counter attack. I do feel, I still do feel that Tyrone are the most equipped team in the country to, to pose them a serious challenge this year. Like I've said that from, from a long time ago. Um, you know, when Tyrone were written off, I did feel that, that they could come back and and, uh, and be here at the business end. Um, for me, my only concern about Dublin is that... You know, they have lost that sort of instinctive nature with, you know, a Conley or, or, or a Brogan that they had a couple of years ago. And their team's very methodical. You know, it's full of it's full of athleticism. It's full of athletes first and foremost, you know. And that's one of the reasons why they, they probably play, you know, it looks to, to the naked eye that they play so adventurous and so attacking. But they break with so much power and pace and athleticism. You know, it, 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 it looks like that, you know. But don't get me wrong, they're still fabulous footballers. But I think they might just miss that little bit of maybe instinctive nature that... that 
than a, than a Conley would, you know, doing something outside of the norm that maybe they just don't have this year, you know. But they they're still they're still a wonderful side, like wonderful side. And is that as much, Stephen, to do with the the drop off in form from Conor Callaghan as well? Because Conley wasn't in the team as we know last year from the Carlo game. He didn't mm. start again, and Conor Callaghan yeah. was that game breaker, the guy that was going to produce something really instinctive, which is the word that you've used both in the semi final and the final, probably taking on a goal opportunity when on the face of it when the move began wasn't actually there and he is that one guy that can do it his form has dropped off so when you remove both O'Callaghan and Connolly from the equation there actually isn't that flair player in there maybe a Costello coming in off the bench might be that kind of a guy but is it, it doesn't seem to be a worry though why would it be a worry if all the other guys are going about their business in that methodical fashion as you say they are yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. Like, and look, you know, suppose one of the things we've got to remember about young Con O'Callaghan is he's 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 still only a pup. You know, he's only out of under twenty one. So you would expect that lad to step up every single week and, and show the the same level of maturity as a 27, 28 year old would do is is pretty unfair, I suppose. You know, because Con had a had a had a season of of a lifetime last year. When you looked, I think I've seen a thing on Twitter where you looked at his honours that he'd won through hurling and football, and and maybe that that heavy schedule of a year, maybe it's just caught up on him a little bit this year, you know, so probably a little bit unfair to, to maybe ask that lad to uh, to be stepping up every week, but um, no, there's there's no doubt about it, and it's the spread of scores too that comes too, guys, you know, and but interestingly enough, like, you know, the Tyrone team as well had 13 different scores last weekend, you know, and there's very few counties there across the country would have had 13 different scores in a, in a, in a in what was the equivalent of an All-Ireland quarter-final, you know. Yeah, take on maybe that point about Tyrone, if you will, Stephen, just I mean, it's all in the context of, of Dublin, obviously, but on Tyrone specifically, did we see enough from them in Healy Park in the Super 8s or maybe did they see enough from themselves to convince them uh, convince themselves that they're maybe not that far off Dublin standard? No, there's no doubt about it. Listen, Tyrone, for me, guys, are, are, are a very well-oiled machine, you know, and they've got to... St- Look, you know, you're looking at Sunday's game and you're thinking to yourself, like, for, for me, probably one of the biggest strengths of Tyrone is their flexibility in their system and, and their adaptability. You know, for example, Peter Hart tends to line out at, at wing half back in a lot of first half of games and in the second half of games, he tends to go to centre half forward and Mickey trusts his players, you know, um, they probably trust him. Uh, you know, there's serious flexibility across the board, even their full back line, like young Michael McKernan's come in this year and, you know, is a solid footballer, really good on the ball. Rory Brennan as well is starting to see starting a cornerback this week, you know. And one of the things about Tyrone, and I do really, really admire them, is is that flexibility in their system. And the, and another thing about them too as well is that the ball retention. Tyrone are all very, very comfortable on the ball. They're all good footballers first and foremost. Mickey likes to fill his team of footballers. For example, if Frank Burns has spent this year playing centre half back, but yet Frank Burns would be regularly seen lining out for his club at full forward, you know. So. Um, I do feel I do feel I've I've seen Tyrone grow. Uh, you know that when we played them, one of the, the aspects that I really thought was a standout aspect was their strength and conditioning levels. Peter Donnelly's done a fantastic job there over the last couple of years. Um, he was with Cavan for five years, and the results spoke for itself there. Uh, Cavan won five consecutive under twenty one championships, and, and you know strength conditioning wise, were were in phenomenal shape for for a young side. But Tyrone were bringing guys off lads against Carlo and they were bringing guys on who were 10 kilos heavier you know and we were bringing guys off and bringing guys on that were 10 kilos later you know and that's the serious strength and depth that they possess I think their bench the last day scored 2-5 I think it was 2-5, 2-6 yeah. against Donegal um, Lee Brennan again for me i seen Lee Brennan playing colleges football um, and you know Lee Brennan is a, is, a, is a serious talent like a wonderful footballer you know and, and he's coming off the bench when defences are stretched and, and, and kicked not forward again Donegal so you know, I, I, there'll be listen. There'll be one thing about Tyrone guys is, and both teams actually, they carry a fanatical support. Uh, Monaghan and Tyrone both carry a fanatical support. There'll be a great atmosphere on Sunday, but there'll be a serious level of belief in that Tyrone camp um, that they can that they can win this All Ireland. You know, they haven't been in an All Ireland final for like ten years. Last year's semi final defeat made it look as if they were as far away from an All Ireland final or an All Ireland win. As they've, as they've ever been. And one of the big criticisms, obviously, afterwards was that lack of flexibility. But in terms of where they've come over the last 12 months, and obviously you're fairly uniquely placed having to plan against them, um, what, uh, what, is, is that what you're seeing as the main difference between Tyrone now and Tyrone 12 months ago? Is, is what, sorry? The oh. lack of flexibility from 12 yeah. months ago to now. Yes, oh, sorry, the lack of flexibility. Yeah, well, I, f- I felt now in the semi-final, I was at a lot of their games last year, the... The good wife's a Tyrone woman, so uh, we would have went to a lot of the games last year. But 
I felt last year in the semi-final they were, they were a little bit unfortunate with the start. You know, Dublin got a whirlwind start. Matty Donnelly was carrying the ball. I think I can remember it very vividly. He was carrying the ball. He gave it away on the halfway line. <clears throat> the Dublin broke. Conor Callan slipped inside and got the goal. And I think that put Dublin four points clear very, very early on. And it became a chasing game then. And the, and the key thing is, like I suppose Tyrone have maybe learned a little bit uh, about chasing games. They had a chase the game against Donegal and done so very successfully. Uh, they had a chase the game in the league against, or sorry, in the group stages against Dublin, and, and done so with more success than they did in the final or the, the semi final last year. So, you know, I do feel they've maybe evolved a little bit, and I think one of the major things that has evolved has been that strength of the bench. I think it could be the, the deal breaker on Sunday. I think Tyrone's bench maybe offers a little bit more than Monaghan, um, and it's also as well as as I've already pointed out that flexibility and that ability for. Mickey likes to change his teams up at half time. So I think if Tyrone are in this game on, on Sunday at, at half time and you know the, he likes to change, for example, you know, you have a match up, Peter Hart lines out at wing forward, you get somebody to tag him, and then all of a sudden at half time you come out and Peter Hart stand at corner forward and you're thinking to yourself, right, you know, do you pull your match up back to there and you change your team around and Mickey favours that approach. He likes to mix things up at half time, so you know, it, it, it. Listen, he's he's evolved and grew with the game, and I know that Mickey will be hurting from last year's semi-final defeat, and I'm sure he is. He's examined every aspect of it, and he's looked at every corner and every avenue of, of what they did wrong and what went wrong, and you know he'll have he'll have every I dotted and every T cross. But obviously, Sunday is a mammoth challenge because on the other camp, Malachy O'Rourke will see this as Monaghan's greatest ever opportunity to get to an All Ireland final. So, uh, you know, you write Monaghan off at your pearl, of course. Well, that's the thing, Stephen. I just wanted to bring that up that. Naturally, uh, the, all the talk in the media has been about Dublin because of what an experience that was from them last year. And it seems that Mickey Hart has taken that and actually learned from it and evolved this year, particularly when it comes to their contributions off the bench. So when it comes to Monaghan this weekend, like you can't really read into how Tyrone might beat Dublin whatsoever because that's an entirely different game plan. That's a whole unique school of thought for every GA manager out there. So is there a worry now that Mickey Hart may not have the plan to beat Monaghan, that the, the ball retention that you mentioned might be far more key against a team like Monaghan than it would be against a team like Dublin? Yeah, listen, one one thing, guys, that I was very impressed with when Monaghan played Galway was their patience, you know, and I know Tyrone have this sort of concept where they try and get you into that sort of spider's web of theirs and, and turn you over. And, you know, one of the things that Monaghan didn't do was very, very seldom against Galway did Monaghan engage in the tackle. Very seldom did Monaghan go in the middle of Galway. You know, what Monaghan actually done was very shrewd. They identified Galway's left-hand side of their defence as, as being quite suspect, quite weak. And they started a lot of their attacks down that side. They, they transferred the ball across. It was nearly a double treble switch. And then, and then really went hard at that left side, you know, and a lot of Monaghan scores in the first half came down that side. So when it comes to tactical astuteness, Malachy rocks up there with the best of them. Um, you know, they, they'll they'll have looked at Tyrone. They'll believe that they can find a way to beat Tyrone. They'll probably adapt a similar approach. Like the Galway game is perfect for Monaghan because Monaghan's style is not really going to change on Sunday. You know, it's going to be a very patient approach. It's going to be a lot of lateral football. It's not going to be a game for the kick and catch purists, but... It's it's going to be a tactical battle, and and I just feel that you know Tyrone will need to be at their best, and and it's probably been understated. I think Philip Jordan might have missed it during the week. Does uh, the impact of the two goalies, yeah. uh, Rory Began and Niall Morgan? I thought Rory Began gave one of the best displays of goalkeeping that I've seen in a long time against Galway. Uh, I thought his distribution was unbelievable from open play and from place balls. Uh, he also chips in with a score or two. Now Niall Morgan to be fair to him against Donegal on Sunday when he gave that short kick out away a lot of goalkeepers you know probably would have wilted he missed a couple of frees and you know but to be fair to Niall he stepped up and I think Niall has grown in maturity as well uh, Niall has become a very very pivotal figure in uh, Tyrone's game plan and both teams will press each other's kickouts they'll go zonal uh, that's the that's the approach they like to take Tyrone like to sort of play a a three three four formation when they go zonal, uh, but they do leave little gaps in around the half back line for for short kickouts and if they do that, Bagan won't be won't be behind the doors and finding those little gaps you know so it'll be very interesting it'll be very interesting it's going to be a very tactical battle I hope that it lives up to the expectations like I cannot see an extremely high scoring affair but. You know, for me, lads, I, I just feel that, that the spread that Tyrone have across the board w could probably edge this. Well, the, for, it's interesting you say that because one of the first things you said there would suggest that Monaghan have a huge edge in this game in the idea that they won't bring the ball into contact because Sean Cavan has been harping on all summer about how Tyrone are the best team in transition bar none. But they're not going to get any real chance in transition if Monaghan aren't bringing the ball into contact. And just to take that point on a little bit more, you mentioned there 
uh, a double treble switch, which Monaghan do when they've got the ball. What is that? Well, for example, what will happen known is they'll take the ball down one wing, they'll switch it across to the far side line, and it's look the terminology that I would use for it would be would be sort of in outs. You know, they would take the ball to the sideline, someone would come off the line, take the ball, it would be transferred to the other side of the pitch, and then transferred back again. And if you look at Galway. Galway are sort of in the infancy of their of their uh, system with with Paddy. So zonally and tactically awareness, Galway still tend to follow the ball in packs. So what will happen is Galway will naturally gravitate towards the ball, you know, and then it's transferred again, and little gaps and little holes will appear. For me, Tyrone are probably a little bit more structured than Galway uh, in that aspect. So Monaghan might not just find the same gaps in the same spaces when they do make those double and travel switches. So, but I, I can see Sunday's game lads being like a sort of a. Uh, we, we would have travelled to Kilmacud, sorry, Sevens quite a bit as the club uh, in the day before all Ireland final day. And we used to say in Sevens football, it's nearly like a tennis match. You know, when you have your serve, you have to keep it. And I think that on Sunday, it's got to be pivotal that, you know, whenever you have scoring opportunities, you take them or the ball goes dead. Because if you are turned over on Sunday, you know, it, a, a double score in a game like Sunday could be huge. Uh, so again, go back to the point I made as well. That's where the goalkeepers will play in a major, a major part as well. Both teams will want to try and retain as many of their kickouts as possible and try and break even on some of the oppositions. You're calling it for Tyrone, Stephen? I'm, I'm going to call Tyrone, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to call Tyrone slightly. I just feel, you know, as I said to you guys, the flexibility that they have, the bench that they have and the spread of scores, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go for them, but in, but in a in a very close encounter. Uh, before we let you away, this down job is up for grabs at the minute. Are you interested? Listen, lads, I have enough problems in my life. No, listen, <laughs> hey, uh, look, look, it's, it's, uh, uh, look, it's a job that's up for grabs. I've seen in the paper this morning. I thought it was a little bit disrespectful towards Paddy Talley to, to mention his name in the paper this morning on the on the eve of, of a huge game for him. But Paddy would be a fantastic man. I'd be delighted to see someone like Paddy take the job. Um, you know, for me, he's 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 up there with one of the best in the country. Uh, look, listen. What we do need, lads, is we need energy. We need uh, we need the thing to get a lift. You know, I'm a down man by heart, obviously, and you know, I, I hope that that the right decisions made for the, for the benefit of the county because the whole thing's been very flat, very dead, and you know, there's a lack of apathy towards the county board, guys. I can't put my finger on it. I don't know what it is, but um, you know, we just need the whole county pulling together. I seen it last year, lads. What can be done when a county comes together and you get a bit of momentum and a feel good factor, and you know, I just think. It needs a lift everywhere, you know, and and, and I hope that the, that the right decision's made. Like. Yeah, a Paddy Talley, Stephen Poacher combination might be the way to go. Ah, oh, no, listen, pa Paddy, Paddy couldn't deal with my intensity and my enthusiasm. <laughs> like I, would drive, I would drive him insane, you know. Stephen, thanks so much for taking the call this morning. Lads, not a problem, pleasure. Thanks a lot, pleasure. Stephen Poacher there, the uh, Carlo football coach on the line previewing the weekend. Tyrone and Dublin, Dave, hard to look past it, really. Yeah, I think Dublin will beat Galway. Um, uh, I would do expect a bit of a bounce back from Galway tomorrow. I think they're far better than what they showed last weekend. And yeah, a little bit of their momentum has been stymied with the manner of the performance against Mona in particular. But they've shown that they are a team that are progressing every week. I don't know if they have the weapons to take Dublin down in Croke Park in particular. They couldn't manage to beat Dublin in the league final. And I think Dublin are a different proposition now than, than what they were against uh, Galway back in April, very early in April as well. Although I'm saying that Galway still have gone to Croke Park since they've beaten Kerry and they have uh, come out of the right sort of a brilliant game against Kildare so they've progressed as well but look if they beat Dublin it's an almighty shock mm. Sunday I mean there's a reason why Stephen kept um, talking about the Tyrone bench mm. because Monaghan don't really have a bench in terms of game changers when it comes to scoring mm. there are three Super 8 games not a single point contributed by their substitutes now if you get to Croke Park against a Toronto team that knows its way around Croke Park, against a Toronto team that had 2-5 off the bench against Donegal, four points off the bench against the All-Ireland Champions Dublin in the second round of their Super Ace game. That almost took them, should have been five points, with Ron O'Neill missing that free that would have left a single point between them with still enough time left for another kick-out. I think if you get to the last 20 minutes of this game on Sunday and it's in any way close... I can only see one winner. I think Monaghan are going to have to be foot perfect mm. on Sunday afternoon. Their two biggest guys, Conor McManus and Rory Began, are probably going to have to supply 80% of the scores. So if somebody in, in the Tyrone colours or two or three of them can completely shut down Conor McManus, if they can be disciplined in the tackle and not afford Began and McManus the opportunity to kick place balls, it's a bit tougher with Began because you can commit a foul 65 metres from your own goal He's thinking you're pot, fine yeah. and next of all it's floating over the bar. But uh, so maybe you can you can't legislate for what Began might produce on the day. But the weather is meant to be mixed enough this weekend. I'm not sure it's going to help the kickers on Sunday afternoon. And 
they've had their number in 2013 and 2015 at Crow Park when in both games I fancied Monaghan to go well. So I think I would be surprised if Monaghan won on Sunday. I just think Tyrone now are, are coming and they dismantled Donegal in that last quarter, having come from five points down on two different occasions. It's hard to know how much of that was down to, like, Tyrone looked so gassed over the last 15 minutes. They were, even when they were two points up... Donegal, you mean? Uh, sorry, Donegal. They were knocking the ball around their own sort of half-back line in a way that said, we've got two points now. There was 15 minutes to go. There was too much to go in the game to be knocking it around, sort of trying to protect the lead. They look, And then once... Tyrone put the foot down. They looked just totally gassed. They had no response. It was hard to know how much of it was down to Donegal and how much it was down to Tyrone's excellence. Well, I could that see something Donegal similar happening. Huge slice. Yeah, it is, but I, I, I would see Monaghan in the same boat. Yeah, like I think Donegal butchered that game last weekend as well. It was not only the extent to Clare butchering their big opportunity against Galway, but it wasn't too many miles off it. When they were four points up, the amount of runners they had, they weren't passing the ball off to them when they had opportunities to get into scoring positions to go six points up, potentially even seven points up, and they didn't take that. Their they, mindset changed. Their mindset the equivalent changed. of running it into the corner and trying to hold on to it. It seemed Precisely. crazy, crazy tactic. Exactly. Uh, like As the week's gone on, like I've kind of moved from Dublin winning by 10 to Dublin winning by 7, uh, like suddenly giving Galway all of, all of the chance in the world because Dublin are only going to win by 7. And I think after chatting to, to Paddy Talley there, like I know he, t- I know he tipped Tyrone, but a lot of things he were saying there like, would really give Monaghan a lot of hope, especially if, if conditions get any bit slippy at all. I, obviously, that'll favour Tyrone, but if it's a fine day, I, I wouldn't write off this Monaghan team whatsoever. Like, it's, it's, good, it's good that you've actually stood up and admitted that Dublin stand a much better chance because it's in Crow Park. I mean, like if... if Their the home ga- ground, like Like, it. if it was in a neutral venue or if it was in Salt Hill, obviously, Galway would stand a much better chance, but dub- the dubs at home being the third best team of all time, they've got one hell of a chance of beating Galway at the weekend. <laughs> well, it's uh, certainly the, la- the latter part of that last sentence. We'll, we'll ignore that for the moment. But it's it's not just that it's Dublin playing at their home ground. It's that they are up against a team that just haven't spent that much time sure, in Croke yeah. Park. And before this year, hadn't won a championship match in Croke Park since they won the All-Ireland Final against me in 2001. Um, they, For me, Galway have already made their step up. They had to go to Croke Park and win a big game, and that was the one against Kerry. And that immediately was an improvement of the two quarter-final defeats to Kerry. It was at 2014 and 2016. Mm. So I think, uh, well, not 2016, because Tip beat them, 2015 and 13. 2017. 2017, did they, did they get the quarters last year? Who beat them? last year, Kerry. Kerry, and where they just didn't look like it, it was going to happen for them in the last quarter, that they didn't really have it in them to, to go that extra step. So they've already made progress. Yeah. Um, it's, but where, it's, where's the, where is the progress? Is it like reaching an All-Ireland? Is it winning an All-Ireland? And I guess, in fairness to Kevin Walsh, the way they approached last week probably suggests that they want to actually win the All-Ireland because they couldn't care less when they played Dublin, basically. See, winning the All-Ireland... I don't know, I thought it was foolhardy. Yeah. We should have gone out last weekend to... Well, he picked his best team, though. But you know, they, his, team, his team his team selection played, didn't yeah. um, sp- that's speak what of a guy. They sort of fell between two stools. They picked their best team and then didn't perform. Yeah, but I don't know how much of that is down to Kevin Walsh. I'm sure Kevin Walsh said and did all the right things in the build-up to that game. There's no way he sent that Galway team I'm not, out I'm not necessarily blaming him. I just mean that it was, it was neither, neither one nor the other, as it turned out. You know, they didn't get the but opportunity uh, that to sent, a bunch of I think that's down to human instinct. Probably, yeah. You know, really, that in the back of your mind, you know this is not the be-all and end-all. And yes, you can tell yourself, we have to avoid Dublin, but that will only take you so far mm. in a game against an, up, an opponent that is frothing at the mouth, mm. as Monaghan were, where the Monaghan supporters outnumber the Galway supporters, and their need is so infinitely greater than yours human instinct kicks in and when it comes to those 50-50 balls that they will definitely be going for tomorrow maybe they didn't go without much um, of it happening consciously maybe they just didn't go for them as they would have done against Kerry Crow Park or against, against Kildare and Newrich for example yeah. now you know if they bring the performance levels right back up to the optimum is, is that going to be enough to really push Dublin tomorrow evening if Dublin play as you know, languidly as they have at times in this year's championship. They have made a lot of mistakes. They've been very sloppy at times. The, I'm trying to remember which game I saw them in Croke Park. It was the Donegal game. Incredibly sloppy that afternoon. And I think Galway, if they'd had a little more belief in themselves, mm. could have been much closer Donegal, than the yeah. five points they were Donegal going into the last 10 minutes. If they play like that tomorrow evening, I actually give Galway a chance of catching them at the end. But that was at the very beginning of the Super 8. I think what happened against Ross Common is perfect for Dublin because, yes, you're up against a beaten docket, but four or five of the players that started last weekend really put their hands up. Mm. Paul Flynn most notably. And I'd say the competition this weekend, this week in training for Dublin, anyone who thought they were a shoe in for a place in the team, but maybe haven't been performing out of their skin, 
they would have been looking over their shoulder in the last week. And the Dublin team that's picked for tomorrow night's game is, I think, is going to be on the edge as they need to be if they're going to go on and win this All Ireland. So I think they would beat Galway. For me, it's just a question of by how much is it a tight game in which Galway perform well. Or do Dublin show us just how good they are and win by double digits? I think it might be the latter. Not sure about double digits, but I, I do think we're going to see finally a swashbuckling Dublin. I've been told on my screen, this is not me, this is Tommy. Uh, Owen, we should put this Clifford stat up after poetry. It's <laughs> on my screen, so have a look at this. I swear I didn't. You didn't so send this to him before. I didn't, actually. But, uh, this is, um, yeah, oh, yeah, don't follow. yeah, this is actually great. I saw this on Twitter yesterday. Uh, Clifford's extraordinary super eights, two from two and freeze. They're the yellow ones. Four goals from four goal attempts, 12 from 17, 71% in point attempts, at 78% in total scoring, around 11 points more than an average inter county player would. Hashtag yeesh. And uh, yeesh indeed. Um, yeah, for I, me, the only question with Clifford is with five or six years of inter county experience at senior level, how much better can he become? Like, he has the potential by the time he reaches his 25th birthday, to be the single greatest forward we have ever seen. Mm. My fear would be that his brilliance right now is as brilliant as he's going to be. Potentially. Well, that's not bad. No, it's not bad at all. And like he's going to win an All-Star and he was the standout player for this Kerry team. He scored 4-14 in yeah. three games in which Kerry were not a factor really. Um, Tommy's asked me, is he going to win an All-Star this year? Because he's probably opening his betting account as we <laughs> speak. <laughs> I'm trying to think... That, have you confirmed? I'm it? speaking to Tommy here through the glass. I'm trying to think of, you know six other fours that have performed better than he has in this year's championship? Yeah, the question, I think he's an all-star. The question is, who gets the young player of the year, himself or Brian Howard? And you'd expect yeah. Howard's got enough road left in front of him. To he has plenty of road that. left, but I think it ne as brilliant as Howard has been, and he has been a revelation for Dublin. And he looks like he's been playing for Dublin for five or six years, as yeah. Clifford does for, in terms of Kerry. I think Howard needs to do something pretty special in the semi-final and the final. Now, you know, there aren't too many players that... Um, Win an All Star, having been on a team that's been knocked out in the All Ireland quarter final stages. The vast majority of them do come from the yeah. four semi finalists. But that's the super the nature of the super eights, though, isn't it? Yeah. So you, you get a more rounded view as an All Star exactly. panel. I'm yeah, sure that's yeah, a godsend absolutely. that you can actually see everybody or see all the players in the quarter final stages three times. You can actually get exactly. a, a good sample size. It's not. He's not like. He's also not like your typical player, Cl uh, Clifford. In that, like, he was so out of place at minor level. Like, it was this guy is like a ma ma literally a man amongst boys at minor level. Like, he was seamlessly not. Literally. Senior game. He was literally a boy. I mean, he was under yeah. 18. Physically. Are you saying that he physically. was over age? <laughs> physically. <laughs> physically, yeah. He looks, we're back yeah. to Rice and McManaman's uh, point now about the under 14s. But, but he um, will, he, as physically imposing as he is even at senior level, he will still now spend more time in the gym. The SNC, the quality of that he's getting mm -hmm. within, within the Kerry setup will improve. It'll bring him on. He'll bulk up a little. Obviously, experience. Becomes so you need a factor upper body well. strength, though, Dave, is really the big question. Of the no, I'm, it's all that. nothing to do with his performance, but just so he can look good on the field. Yeah. That's, what it, that's what it's all about. <laughs> now we're cooking. OTBM is live with Screwfix.ie, championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products. We're going to get some uh, Owens fantasy Premier League team, I believe, on. Is that right? Are we? Shortly, I think we are. Now? Uh, we're going to no. know in a couple of minutes. I'm going to talk to Dave about um, <laughs> the, time the start of the Premier League it. season. We're all pumped for it. And Chris Kamara as well to uh, to come. But first, before all of that, here's uh, actor Paddy Considine. He was on with the uh, with Andy Lee uh, earlier in the week in OTBM talking about the uh, brilliant film Journeyman. Paddy, the thing that blew me away about the film was just the amount of detail that you got correct. And it's one of the things that most boxing films, you know, don't do. What kind of research did you do for the film, or how did you study for the film? Well, you know, I've been a, a fan of boxing since I was a, a kid, and uh, you know, I've been around sort of boxing people, and I'm a fan of the sport. So I'll, I'll, you know, there's lots of sort of watching press conferences and watching all the, you know, the twenty four sevens and behind the ropes and all that kind of thing. I'm a fan, so you just absorb all of that. Um, and then when it, with regards to the, the sort of the boxing world. Um, I tried to make it as authentic as I possibly could. So when there's like a press conference, we got Mike Goodall to set it up. We got actual boxing press sat there asking questions. Um, Francis Warren to be the promoter. So it, there's just this other level of authenticity to the film, like Steve Bunce in the film um, playing himself. And I thought bringing in people mm. from that world would somehow just make it more authentic. 
Yeah, pretty interesting conversation. It's all up on youtube.com forward slash off the ball with uh, Paddy Considine there. Uh, so we mentioned Owen's fancy Premier League team. Nobody nobody gives a shit about my fantasy Premier League team. but well, that's, So that's your challenge to yeah, make people give a shit you about should, it. You should care about it. Uh, this is it. I don't know why I'm putting this up. Are you supposed to keep your uh, cards close going, to your... Is that? Yeah, there is actually. Uh, the code will be brought up as a super on the bottom of the screen very shortly, I'm sure, Tommy. Uh, <laughs> we've, uh, we do have a league going. It's called the OTBAM League. Well, they're, they're, we say now that there are... It's not just an off-the-ball league. Why do we need to have splinter groups? Um, it, well, no, the league is an off-the-ball league, but we just put the brand OTBAM on it because, you know... Oh, you swiped the I've, take, I've taken ownership of it. What time is, is the deadline at 11 o'clock this morning? Uh, no, at around 6 o'clock. Well, 7 o'clock. Kick-off is at 8 o'clock tonight, isn't it? So, yeah, an hour before kick-off. Well, this is my team for the audio listeners... Uh, it's uh, Foster, Robertson, Mendy, Steve Cook, Salah, Bernardo Silva, Mane, Jota, King, Aguero, Zaha. That's my starting eleven with Patricio, Hughes, Cedric, and Juan Bissaka on the bench. Right. Um, yeah, great. Us, what was your thought process with uh, putting Juan Bissaka on the bench? He costs four point zero million. <laughs> 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 he uh, we, we, listen. I, Is that the cheapest player when you when you scroll down? No, not at all. Listen, myself and Juan Bissaka had a frank discussion, and we said, "Listen, it's best yeah, for you to sit out this frank. weekend, mate." And he was like, "I'm out of here, manager." Uh, so there's a bit of uh, trouble True. in paradise. Uh, his problem was the team. window was closing, and he couldn't find another club quickly enough. Window was closing. How much is, was Mane out of interest? Because him being down as a midfield player is obviously outrageous, isn't it? It's That's a no-brainer to have him in your yeah. team. Uh, Nine million. Salah's thirteen million. Okay. Salah's one of the most, ex- the joint most expensive player in the history of fantasy football, from what I can recall. At a What's your budget? Price. Uh, hundred million. Okay. So you've you spent a lot. You spent twenty two million there straight away on two Liverpool players, which is a lot. Aguero obviously is a must after his performance last week. By the way, the the fancy league um, code is up on screen there for audio listeners. Just get to the Facebook page. Just go to the Facebook page. Like, yeah. Like, Owen's going to organise some prizes as well, so he's going to announce that before the end. I of better the show put a today. team together. A signed photograph um, of Dave McIntyre will be prize for month number one. <laughs> Dave, and when Dave you can't Williams put a price on that. Beefcake. Exactly. Um, do you need to beefcake up for triathlon? Probably don't really. The swim, I know the swim is a bit obviously more upper body. Beefcake now being a verb. <laughs> beefcake up. Jesus, uh-huh. there you are looking like. Did you get a new wetsuit? No, well, I've, bo- I've borrowed one. Brush oh. shields. That's uh, There's brush we- Is that brush a compliment shields. to me or brush? Um, brush. I've <laughs> borrowed one from a friend, got it yesterday. I've yet to row test it. So you're doing the. What, when's the triathlon? It's on the 8th of September. That's why you're in this morning, really, is to plug up um, the fact that you want to get people on to... I want to raise some money, yes. Um, If you go to the GLS Ireland Facebook page, the link is there. uh, They're sponsoring me to do the triathlon. The link is there if you want to contribute to... GLS Ireland. They are an international shipping company who asked me to come on board as a sporting ambassador. Raised eyebrow through <laughs> throughout the studio, and um, I'm just trying to raise some money for the Father Peter Mike Very Trust. So you can either get me on the GoFundMe page, or you can go to the GLS Ireland Facebook page, and all the link is there. Even if you have a f- spare fiver, lob it in there. Um, it would be great. Got the details up on your Twitter account. I do, Come I on. do, and I'll be I'll be um, tweeting regularly on it over the next month. Are you or so. a swimmer? No. Have you been? No. The bike and the run, no races? problem. We I went for a long cycle earlier in the week. I think we, we did, a friend of mine who's a keen cyclist, we did 55k on the bike. And the, uh, we s- cycled out to Maynooth and back it's towards Castle Rock. It's flat track though, isn't it? That's, oh I mean, yeah, is, we, is weren't, we, wasn't, we weren't going up the Alto Is the triathlon track a flat track? Um, it's in, a lot of it's in around the park, so there'll be a right. few hills here and there, but uh, it's only 20 kilometres, that's right. not the problem. The problem is actually still being alive as I get onto the bike. So have you, have you been taking swimming lessons? No, I can swim, but I can swim to save my life. I would whether uh, or not I need and I spent a lot of time in the water in the last month yeah. and can you dive? It, well there's no diving required <laughs> what are you what, what? no uh, <laughs> I, I don't I, need to be Oliver Dingley to, I did, to complete um, this triathlon I did a triathlon about five or six years ago uh, down at Lone and I, by the sounds of things we were sort of sw- similar sort of levels as swimming uh, our swimming technique was similar sort of area but I got lessons and it's a total game changer like it's actually nothing I found that swimming was nothing to do with power of strength I mean there's an element of it but the technique thing once you nail that it's uh, infinitely easier okay that's definitely I, something I should take on board because I'm still using the same technique I learned when I was six years old go and get um, lessons, Dave. if there is anybody who wants to teach me how to swim properly that's listening this morning please do get in touch it's, it's, you should watch some I mean, you probably have some triathlons but there's a load of the load of aspects to it that you wouldn't have even considered beforehand like the 
they lap in at the start. I'm sure there's another uh, more technical term for it, but like the elbows are flying, and there's like um, I mean people in there who actually want to do well as opposed I'll to be the likes back. Of you and I who want to just f survive the thing. I'll be hanging back, so I will, and then I'll just try and pick off whoever I can possibly pick <laughs> off in the um, on the bike and on the road. But no, I think I'll be going out the final wave at the back of the final wave. What's the distance swimming distance? Uh, Seven fifty. Right. Seven fifty meters. Well, have you are you up to that yet? No. What are you, no. what are you swimming? Um, I've swum 750, but right. in like three different tranches. In fairly rough seas, though. It's yeah. in The triathlon is in the Liffey. So it's going to be a, a bit calmer than some... I was down in Ventry last week. That's where the wetsuit was ripped. Oh, yeah. And trying to um, take on the seas down in Ventry, which I, it t at one stage it took me 20 minutes to swim 150 metres. <laughs> but, That's good prep, though. Uh, but I was thinking, don't get out. Just If you can just get to this... Yeah lifeguard cabin which is somewhere up in the distance yeah. um you can definitely take on the liffy now but um no i take on point i take on board your point about the, the swimming technique i'm sure it's all wrong when, when i that when, there are ways to make it much easier on myself when we did the classes so i'd been doing some swimming before that and you'd do whatever number of lengths as the entire thing so let's say i would do six uh, ten lengths let's say as a as a that was my swimming session and you go down there and you'd do seven or eight lengths as a warm-up <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's that sort of stuff. But it does, it definitely gets easier and easier and easier the more your yeah, technique Yeah, I just need to spend time in the water and I have, a, I have another month to do that. And uh, thanks to my to my friend Brian, who's given me another wetsuit to try and get through the After next month. The previous because I went, I brought it into a, a, you know, a clothes alterations place yesterday and that have um, a reputation for dealing with all sorts of zip-related issues. Zipyard. Yes. Well, I, there are other... other. Th are I wasn't going to give them a plug because they told me they couldn't do anything for me, so I wasn't going to give them the plug. But, uh, yeah, they said this is beyond repair. Yeah, fair enough. So there you go. Well, we should see that the video of your diving fail, which is what I was referring to. <laughs> oh, and sorry. Not, not <laughs> up sorry. That, sorry thanks, on. thanks for telling me that. <laughs> if, if you missed any of the details there, we will be robustly uh, shoehorning in a triathlon mention again in the crappy quiz later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Good, 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 thanks, good, listen. good luck with it, yeah. Well done, Dave, and for a great cause as well. So do go up and throw your fiver on or your tenner on or whatever it is. Um, nearly 10,000 views apparently on that uh, diving video, which I know you like all? to... Uh, I was expecting I like six figures about. at this stage. That's funny as hell though. I mean, people should go, <laughs> really go and check it out. A um, couple of bits of business before we get to our Chris Kamara interview, which is going to wrap up today's uh, interesting on a couple of topics, including John Giles, he really lights up on um, as his, uh, his hero. So um, that's to come before we leave you. The Premier League obviously returns tonight. Uh, Manchester United up against Leicester City. We're going to take a quick look at some of the fixtures that are upcoming um, uh, over the next couple of days. So, yeah, you've United Leicester tonight. Um, and then a couple of games on off the ball on Sunday, including Liverpool West, uh, Newcastle. Liverpool, Liverpool against West Ham. Uh, Ian Beach and Clinton Morrison will be at Anfield yeah. for us for a right, half-one yeah. kick-off on Sunday afternoon. Uh, and then I'm at the Emirates with Gary Breen for Arsenal Man City at four. Really looking forward to that one. Um, just on the Liverpool thing, I'd been talking to John Giles last night and I wondered about because they've obviously bought smartly Liverpool in sort of key positions and I wondered what impact that would have on Salah because he's scored a lot of goals in a previous system with lesser players ultimately than the quality they've brought in and I wondered sort of what impact that would have and if it would take a little bit of time for that sort of system to gel, um, like they'll have only spent a couple of weeks together really before they um, start headlong into the season. But uh, John was just firmly the view that better players are going to result in Salah scoring more goals. Yeah, it's gonna. It'll be a big ask for him to score as regularly and routinely as he did last season. Like you have to factor in that he was he had scored far more goals last season than he had in any previous campaign for any previous club. Now, obviously, the system suited him. He was playing for a manager that was able to get the very best out of him. Well, I don't. I don't see the system changing. I just think there are better players within that yeah. system. Keita is not great on Henderson if if that's the way he goes Henderson and doesn't play the two of them on the team. There. Well, that, I would imagine that will be the way he plays. But he has said this week probably because there have been a lot of questions question marks raised over the future of Henderson as a, a regular starter that he's still an integral part of the squad and I know he's a real leader within that squad and he had a, ha a decent enough World Cup um, I think the competition now at centre half has gone from pretty much no competition to now having three guys that he will be really happy to have in the team but Dejan Lovren had such a brilliant World Cup that he will think he should be starting every game alongside Virgil van Dijk he had big issues defensively at left full and at centre half he got the checkbook out to replace to get rid of the problem at centre half by bringing in Virgil van Dijk and while he delayed promoting Andrew Robertson to the starting 11 in place of Moreno and people mm. were castigating him for it and um, whatever he was working on with them in the background 
clearly had a, a reap to dividends because he was one of Liverpool's best players in the second half of last season and he's brilliant with his left foot and going forward as well and clearly a major issue in goal which he has now gone out and he has flashed the cash and he has brought in Alisson and I think if you marry Lovren's form Van Dijk we know what he's capable of Alisson and the attacking pearls that they have going forward I think Liverpool are going to be an upgraded version of yeah, what they were last probably not season. a 25 point better team but an upgraded version um, no, but they don't necessarily have to be a 25-point better team. They just need to be able to reel City in a little bit and hope that maybe City don't reach the heights that they did last season. Now, that's, that's a hope rather than an expectation. Um, someday, are you, maybe. Are, you, are you just saying that on the basis no, that I, I if don't it doesn't get, happen, we just ignore it, and then if it does, we get to replay this clip? I don't get the whole riding them off completely as Premier League challenges. Who's riding them off, though? Well, like Adrian's looked there, he's like, nah, come on. You just said Liverpool <laughs> are going to win the Premier League. Yeah, I think they that's, are. That, I, I, I am absolutely certain that is a bold call. If you had said Liverpool have it's a very good chance of winning the Premier League, he may not have... an excellent chance. Yeah. I think they are going to win the Premier League. I'm with Dave there. It's your certainty that has me a little bit sceptical. For me, Liverpool are top two. It's between... Yeah. They, are, they are the only team I genuinely see challenging City beyond December um, for the Premier League title, which unfortunately for all of us as Premier League followers was not the case last season. Yeah. No, I'd agree with that. I think it's City, Liverpool at the top. I think Spurs, the Spurs one's been interesting. Everyone's been making this great deal about the fact <coughs> that it's since 2003, since the window came in, if I'm right, that was the first Premier League club to have not spent a dime yeah. in bringing in any players. But like, it's probably uh, mo been more about... like Success for Spurs in this window has probably been holding on to Ali Green. and Kane and Loris and assuming sort of post World Cup in all of those instances that it's there's a conversation about wages uh, and actually saying to them here's some extra money we're keeping you it would have been amazing for them to have added in a sprinkling of the talent that uh, that Liverpool have done but they but didn't they didn't really negotiate any of those contracts though these they guys didn't. are coming into the new season on the same money that they ended last season so it's not a case that they used the money they didn't spend on fresh faces to right. bolster the pay packets that, of the guys theory, that were already yeah, at the club but no but you know the point you make about it, it being a success in that they haven't lost Ericsson, Deli Ali or Harry Kane mm. that is definitely a valid point but they do need more depth um, for a club that's playing in the Champions League now, season in, season out, they don't have the depth and squad that they need to be able to compete on both fronts. You know, they were one, maybe two 15 minute spells of poor football um, away from a Champions League quarter final. They should have beaten Juventus, absolutely should have beaten them over the two legs. But they, if they didn't win the Premier League or come r remotely close to winning it last season, they have absolutely no chance of um, winning it this season. Been too long talk about Why not? Like, I mean, why, why is there no sort of, uh, like, massive improvement expected? Because I, because I, I don't see where that improvement comes from. They it, haven't was the, like improved how their squad at all, and they have... They're still probably a top four same, team, though. Oh, I think they'll be a top four team, yeah, I do. Will, will the new White Hart Lane not give them a, an extra leap? No. I don't know how the stadium <laughs> change is going yeah. to see them play better football. I they don't know. I, I, to be honest with you, I'm being devil's advocate because I think Spurs are going to start the season quite poorly given a thin squad, given the fact that Harry Kane's not going to be back for quite a while. They're basically missing what was their kind of uh, conduit to success last season, which almost gave them that win over Juventus, which should have been that win over mm. Juventus. I think they're, like, as I say, I'm being devil's advocate because I think it's last chance saloon for Spurs this season. What, what last chance saloon to do what? To keep those players. Oh, I think they're gone anyway, to be honest. I don't see Harry Kane being They need to win the Premier League, next those season. players to say. Yeah, but they, they, won't. they won't win the Premier it's League. I t I'm, you know, <laughs> you make bold statements on the eve of a new season and you can look very foolish towards the end of the season, but I would, I'd be astonished if they're even a factor in mm. the Premier League title probably race right. coming to April. Here, I was going to talk about Mourinho. Let's not bother. It's boring as hell. He's probably going to be gone before the um, season is done. He's a total pain in the hole, so let's not bother uh, talking too much about that. Um, quick word on the golf. The 11 sports coverage has been sort of exercising a lot of people. My really only exposure to it yesterday, so it's, people aren't aware, I'm sure they are at this point, that it isn't on mainstream TV. It's on this 11 sports app and on their Facebook page. Um, my only great exposure to it yesterday was sort of dipping in and out. At one point going over to watch Rory McIlroy miss yet another three-foot putt. Uh, was, it was on the Facebook page on a pretty uh, hardwired Wi-Fi uh, broadband stream. McIlroy draws on the putt shot freezes, pause three seconds, shot returns, McIlroy, oh, no, I missed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, it seems to, and it doesn't seem as if that's an outlier of an experience. Though. No, I had something similar last night. I watched a lot of the golf last night. I was casting it from my phone to my TV and, you know, watching a 
watching a stream from your phone a major golf championship is really not the way anybody wants to be watching a golf tournament you want to be watching it in you know high def um, the best possible picture that you can get the coverage itself is grand you know the the shot by shot coverage is fine it's not what you would expect uh, would be accustomed to watching from Sky or CBS or or the Golf Channel, but it's good. You know, it's absolutely fine. It's the <laughs> the little bits in between that. Ken on um, the course attempts. Yeah, well, it's not even Ken on the course. It's some English dude uh, off the course, and he's bringing us through the pro shop. He had a long, drawn out conversation with the on course meteorologist last night right. at God, one stage he said you know so, the, so there's weather coming in and we're in America so weather means you know thunder and lightning um, and you're called in to save the day if there is a thunderstorm coming in can you walk us through how you save the day and I'm like I really don't give a toss how this guy tells people that there may be some electrical weather coming through I should want to see Rory McIlroy Tiger Woods and Justin Thomas who were on the course at the time yeah. hitting golf shots do they have to bounce out for you know the way that um, some of the coverage would this was to yeah, out this was after the American TV and... networks had gone live. Ah, right, so there okay. was no excuse. So there was, live there was no excuse for this. Right, right, right. Um, and look, it wouldn't bother me if it was a real insight, like if it was a Ken on the course type thing, but this was not an insight. Mm -hmm. He brought us through the pro shop and told us that you can buy golf balls, um, ball markers, sunglasses and a replica of the 18th. Was, was Sky not terrible at the start as well? I don't remember. I think that they had see, Colin Montgomery as part of their panel, if that's what you mean. Who, that was pretty terrible. Sky had. But yeah, yeah but, but at least he was a name that you recognised. I've looked at some of the analysts for Eleven Sports, and I mean, I would consider myself to be something of a golf fan, but I've been. Well, I don't. I didn't recognise them. Sort of I didn't recognise them either. But I would ra much rather a, a guy I've never heard of before delivering good content yeah. than a guy who's I'm very familiar with who's awful. I also think that they're, this is it for them. I think it's like a marketing exercise that they have taken the rights for this tournament. They bounce in, they do the coverage, everybody knows about them and everybody's talking about them and that's job done, they don't need to come back. But I mean, I'm surprised with the PGA Championship, you're saying that the coverage is fine. Like the coverage for a major golf tournament needs to be more than just fine. I'm surprised that they would have signed off on something like this without sort of assurances about the quality of production. Yeah, look, we were in the same boat last year when the, P the PGA was on the BBC and it was dreadful mm -hmm. as BBC's it golf standards have gone. Well, yeah, they didn't have any prep yeah. time and it was they made a really poor effort of it, at it. Um, it doesn't do the, uh, you know, they call it the last shot of glory or glory's last shot, I think is how they, they've described the PGA Championship, it being the final ma major of the year and they're it's trying to pick like it up. Replace with the players as the fourth major. I don't, it's, it's yeah, I, I, no, I don't have that argument, but it's something I would have argued with Joe and Nathan and Golf Weekly over the years. That That's too niche, it's too, too niche for yeah, this. I think you're just rewriting history in a bit of a farcical way. Yeah, sure. It's certainly more hyped, the Players' Championship, this year, without question. Well, let's see how things go next year when the PGA Championship is the third major of the season. Yeah, true. And the Open is the fourth Necessary major. And let's just see uh, how it affects its prestige and, and the hype and the build-up around that. That'll be an interesting one. Dave, thanks a million for coming in. No problem. Nice to look at the uh, continued training and um, people should check out at Dave McIntyre OTV. Yeah, thanks for the plug. I really appreciate well. it. Get the, uh, get the money in. Owen, enjoy your weekend. What's the plans? No, there's no Kerry to go and watch. We'll, uh, we'll see. We'll see how the, the weekend unfolds. Probably go to Croke Park. See what could have been. Just to sort of sit in misery in the corner in your well, own. Kerry, you're playing at Croke Park on Sunday. Flagellate yourself. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, he's got, you've got the minors to look at. Exactly. Banty's babes against, uh, against Kerry on, on Sunday. What a day for Monaghan. Minor and senior, all Ireland semi-finals on the same day. Beaten, it's historic to beaten, stuff. To be beaten twice on the same day is, is going to be some sucker punch for them. There is a very good chance that will transpire, but um, I think there's, I think I have a sneaky feeling one of the two will get through. Yeah. All right. Uh, good stuff. Enjoy the games the weekend, lads. Thanks a million for all of that. And thanks to you uh, for watching. Um, I, we did mention Chris Kamara a bit earlier in the show. He was with us uh, during the week with thanks to Sky Sports. The best place to see Premier League action this season. 159 live matches, including Saturday 3 o'clock kickoffs, which are exclusive to Irish viewers. And they're going to show 31 games between uh, August the 10th and the 1st of October with all 20 clubs uh, featuring in that run. And to launch the new season, they brought Cami over to Dublin. And I spoke with him earlier in the week. Enjoy. I'm delighted to say that we're uh, joined in studio now by one of uh, football's most famous faces and famous voices, Chris Kamara. Welcome to studio. Thank you. You've been here a while. I'm sort of the uh, you're on the rotation here, and I'm the latest one in. So uh. <laughs> we say the best till last. <laughs> <laughs> That's, there's another interview coming after me. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, you knew <laughs> that, that makes that makes absolute sense. Uh, listen, thanks, Miller, for coming in. You are here with uh, Sky Sports. We're obviously on the brink of the brand new season. Oh, and, it's amazing. Isn't uh, it? 159 live games uh, on Sky uh, upcoming, including Saturday's. Three 
3 o'clock uh, kickoffs, which are going to be exclusive to uh, Irish viewers, obviously, and we have the big kickoff on Friday night, United against Leicester City. It's sort of like the World Cup is obviously, it feels as if it's just wrapped up and now the Premier League is just back in, but it's maybe because of that. It's certainly caught me a little bit by surprise, I have to say, the, the return of the new season. So having a huge amount of time to overly think about it or get excited about it. What, what's your... Uh, experience of that, like in terms of the World Cup just being over and the season just starting, are you uh, have you been sort of ever since the last season wrapped up, like mm-hmm. counting down the days on your watch? Or? Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, I think um, England's performance in the World Cup has left a great, you know, feeling around the country, and I think the fixtures in the Championship first weekend were up, um, basically because fe- people have got. You know, football fever once again. You know, people were getting fed up, you know, week in, week out, uh, and thinking, oh, you know, people are diving, people are moaning, people are this, people are that, people are the other. And then all of a sudden we get a real good feel good factor. And Neymar got a bad, got bad press, quite rightly so, for diving around in the World Cup. But it was the best thing that could have happened because everyone sort of like turned on him and turned against him, you know, and even people who didn't know too much about football, you know, um, you know, my mother-in-law for one and, and nothing about, what's he rolling on the floor and all that for, you know, and he'll never become a Brazilian legend unless he takes that out of his game, you know, he's got the, he's got the ability, but, you know, even the Brazilians themselves, you know, you know, he's doing that, he's doing that when he's wearing, you know, one of the most famous shirts in the world. Yeah, it was too much for him, yeah. So, yeah, so the feel-good factor's back, so everybody can't now wait for football. Bring it on. In terms of the Premier League, I I mentioned briefly at the top sort of my excitement levels about it and sort of, you know, how it's just... To be honest, I'll be honest with you, I was flicking around last night, turned on Sky Sports Mix, maybe, and I I, I don't think I'd caught the programme live, but it was Dave Jones... uh, uh, Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville at uh, I think it might have been the Premier League launch and a range of Premier League characters just dropping into the studio to have a chat it was uh, both bizarre and joyful all in the one uh, in the one swoop we went from Marco Arnautovic who it turns out is a very interesting person I hadn't really heard him speak before Pep Guardiola would drop by it was uh, it was a, a, a bizarre but sort of interesting mix I presume the excitement levels around the production teams and on air staff it's sort of bubbling along nicely in terms of uh, the, the new season yeah oh very much so I can't wait um, for goals on Sunday this week you know. who have you got in we've got Big Sam in this week All right. Big Sam's our longest standing guest he had, every year since I've been doing it right. and this is the um, 17th year so Sam, what, what, how did you enjoy your summer is probably question one there, is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was doing yeah. some punditry, I think, wasn't he? That's, I, don't, I, I wondered, was he looking on sort of with a bit of regret? Or yeah, oh, of course he point? was. You know, the biggest disappointment of his career to be sacked by England, uh, you know, and especially, I mean, to be honest, he didn't do that, didn't do a lot wrong, did he? You know, he won his one particular game and... Uh, he didn't do himself any favours either, it's probably the other side of it. No, he didn't do himself any favours, but he, he got suckered into a situation that um, that he shouldn't have been involved with in the first place and then lost his dream job, you know. And and, and as a friend and a mate, I knew how hard yeah. it, it, hit, it hit him, you know, it massively. It was like a sledgehammer hitting him, you know, because that was... He'd fought so hard, you know. When, uh, when I was manager of Bradford... We were 2 nil down to Big Sam's Blackpool. Uh, they came to Valley Parade, which is Bradford's home, uh, and beat us 2-0. Uh, and we went to um, Blackpool the, on the Tuesday after they beat us on the Sunday. We went to Blackpool and we won 3-0. And he got the sack uh, the following day. And I rang him in the afternoon because I didn't get any chance after the game after we beat them. And I rang him because and, and he'd already been sacked by um, the chairman who was in jail. Right, he'd already right. been sacked. His one phone call was to ring Big Sam. And <laughs> yeah, and so I rang him, and oh. uh, uh, Owen Oyston was his chairman, and uh, he was in jail for a misdemeanour. And rang Sam and sacked him straight after that defeat. And I rang him, and Sam was as good as gold. You know, brilliant. Good luck, Cammy. You know you'll win at Wembley. Um, it was always, it was only ever between us, and uh, I just said, "Oh, you know, stayed mates forever since then." Um, and we did go to Wembley and 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 win it. 
Um, but the, the big incentive that that particular day was when we got to Bloomfield Road and Blackpool. Um, unbeknown to Sam, the um, details, coach details for Wembley were in the programme for the Blackpool fans. Right. So uh, I went out uh, and bought 20 programmes and put them everywhere. So every single player, wherever they looked, they saw the coach details right. for Blackpool's trip to win. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a massive incentive for my players, you know. Yeah. And we've talked about it since, Sam, you know, and he just said, like, you know, the, the chief, chief exec or secretary, as they were called in those days, um, done him up like a kipper, mm. you know, mm. by by yeah. just doing That's something as simple as that. Gave us an incentive. Good, good planning, obviously. You don't want to get it in, get it in public, but yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. Oh, yeah, good planning, but don't don't put it in the Absolutely, match program yeah. for the second leg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, got, he got his break over here. He managed Limerick. Was his first managerial job. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I um, presume he's. I mean. There was a time where you sort of felt maybe he wasn't, you know, after the sting as it was uh, with England, there was a large question mark as to whether he was going to get back in the game or not, obviously, at that point. but Well, he had to come back and restore his reputation, and I think um, all he was going to do was come back to Crystal Palace, and I think that that, that was it. Mm. Um, Just so he went out on something that wasn't the way yeah, it was at that time. Yeah, 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 the way it was, yeah. Because... Um, you, you speak to the Sunderland people now, and when England lost to Iceland in the Euros in France, and um, that was the day that Sunderland got relegated, two divisions, because Sam had done such a great job and got them up to 16th, mm. um, ended the season getting a big massive applaud from the crowd, and then of course Roy got the sack that summer, and then they approached Sam. And then that was Sunderland starting to tumble, uh, that irreversible slide. Mm. Um, Jose Mourinho and his, uh, he's been at it again over the course of the summer and um, like generally this side of the water, in the, in the main, like there are pockets of other fans depending on successes. You have pockets of Blackburn fans, black pockets of Leeds fans, but by and large it's United, Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal to a degree. But United... Uh, sort of covers a vast majority of Irish fans and a lot of people are very dialed in to see how United are going to go this season. Um, I was reading a piece by Miguel Delaney in The Independent, I think, yesterday, just talking about Mourinho's career path and he spends a year and it tends to be a pretty good year. It's frequently a title-winning year. Season two, seasons, things get a bit more rocky and into season three, things explode. Like, it feels as if that's exactly the path he's headed on now with United. Mm. Let's hope not. You know, let's hope not. I mean, we, we we can only tell when it starts, can't we? At the moment, it it doesn't look good. But you know, do we believe everything we see? You know, it, if 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 Sir Alex has a go at the board, everybody backs Sir Alex. If Josie has a go at the board, everybody has a go at Josie. Mm. If Josie has a go at his players, everybody blames Josie. Mm. If Sir Alex has a go at his players, everybody backs Sir Alex. It's it's he's in a no-win situation. Fergie has a lot more credit in the bank, probably though, right? Like oh, with, without a doubt. You know, I'm not I'm not I'm not saying he hasn't. I'm just yeah. saying the perception is now you know, that he's not cut any slack anymore yeah. at Manchester United. Yeah. You know, they finished second last year. They, this is the only problem. His improvement now has got to be to win the league, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. So, uh, if he doesn't, if he doesn't finish second, then you know it's slightly backwards again, or, yeah. or whatever, or he doesn't end up in the Champions League final, or, or whatever. Um, it's. I know Jose socially, so he's a friend, uh, and I see another side of him. You know, the management side. At, Obviously, I see that in the interviews and yeah. and the way he treats people from yeah. time to time, and you know it's not great. But we've all been managers; we all understand the pressure. We know what it's like. Mm. He is a winner, and you know sometimes his emotions get the better of him. Um, I think it's going to be a, a wait and see job. You know, the well, worst thing for him now, I think, is well, not just for him, for any manager in the Premier League with the transfer window in England shutting before a ball is kicked in the Premier League, but not shutting in Spain, Italy, anywhere else. Whoever decided that that was a good idea, mm. we all had to stop at the same time because 
if Madrid and Barcelona come in and try to pick players off after our window shut, they can take them. There's business to be done. Yeah. They can take yeah. them, you know. They can take them or unsettle them. So by unsettling them, that means it could be like the Virgil van Dijk situation where you don't go at this moment in time, yeah. but then you don't give your club 100% and then you go in January. Yeah. And Southampton, Mark Hughes was very fortunate in the end. Obviously he wasn't there when Virgil um, had his problems because he obviously was going to go to Liverpool. But, you know, whether he did it intentional or not, Virgil van Dijk, it upset the, what had been a really well-run football club uh, going forward. Yeah, they got 10 more million, but they could have been relegated and lost 150 million. Yeah, yeah, we'll see how that unfolds over the course of the season. Before we wrap, uh, we've got an excellently named item to uh, throw at you here, Chris. It's called Quick Fire Cami. So I'm Good. just going to throw some either ors at you. Uh, you interpret these whatever way you want. Go whatever way. There's no. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of meaning to it, and otherwise it's up to you to do whatever you want. The first one I'm going to throw at you is uh, the the All Ireland series is obviously down to the semi finals at this stage, as I'm sure you're still keeping close track on. Of so. course. That's what it's uh, roughly related to. So I'll just fire these at you. you. You do what you want with them. Dublin or Galway? I've got a little bit of an affinity with the dubs. Right. Yeah, because we went out with the lads and had a few beers with them after. The players? They, they won, yeah, right. yeah. yeah so. And you're going to tell us they're all a shower of songs, <laughs> <laughs> No, they, they were brilliant. Yeah, they were brilliant. That way, yeah. And uh, what, what's the trophy called? Sam Maguire. Sam Maguire managed to get a hold of them. I did really, right? Yeah. That's, uh, I'm from a county that's never going to get their hands on it, uh, Chris. <laughs> oh, well done on that one. Mm. Uh, Love Island or waterboard torture? Um, Love Island. Really? Were you a fan? Uh, I saw a little bit of it. You're, you're a reluctant. You're, you're a, what was it? A shy Brexit ear? Is that the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a shy Love Islander. Yeah, yeah. Right. But uh, Flack, who uh, presents it, Caroline Flack. Um, she's a friend of mine, so um, yeah, so Love Island, definitely. Right, right, right. Uh, John Giles or Bobby Charlton? John Giles. Oh, the good answer. That's oh, the correct answer Johnny, as well. Oh, by the well, way. well, Johnny Giles was my hero when I was a kid. You know, I played for a Sunday Sunday League team when I was fifteen in a men's league, and um, the manager was a fella called Alan Ingles. You and uh, I'd, uh, I'd been to mid support Middlesbrough occasionally in the boys and. And he had season tickets at Middlesbrough and Leeds. All right. And so he took me to uh, to Ellen Road. And I saw this footballer in midfield because my favourite player at Middlesbrough was a midfielder. He was only small. He was a Northern Irish fella called Eric McMordy. Right. And he was good. But then when I saw Johnny Giles at the next level up, it was just amazing. And everyone was Billy Bremner fans, you know, um, Alan Clark, Peter Lorimer, Eddie Gray. And, and I just... What was it about him? And, oh, this fellow, you know, not only was he strong, you know, he could pass, he could, he could see a pass like that that was in another world, you know, yeah. <laughs> the vision, the vision, and he landed on a sixpence for, for the players in front of him and everything, and Billy was his little combative midfield player alongside him, but J Johnny had that vision and that passing ability that was just something else, you know, you know, I could see in the dark, you know, yeah. basically, and so he was my all-time favourite player, as in domestic, I'd have to say Pelly was my favourite favourite player and so I got an opportunity um, uh, two years ago Gary Newborn rang me and uh, it was a programme on Sky called Heroes you know so he said uh, I've been reading your book and uh, Johnny Giles was your hero and he said yeah he said can you do uh, our, he our heroes with him and I said yeah yeah of course so he said it's two weeks I went, no no I've got loads of work on he said well you can't you get rid of the work I went no <laughs> can't just do it like that you know I said give me some more notice and I'll do it and and now the programme stopped on Sky ah right so uh, I'm gutted we I'm absolutely to, gutted we, we could just steal that idea he's on with us every Thursday he's been on with us for a decade is he? comes on every Thursday night for half an hour and oh, talks what, football and what a ledge everyone talks about uh, Leeds giving um, Eric Cantona to Manchester United Manchester United gave Johnny Giles to lead yeah you know that was just as good as. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, well, that's high praise. We'll pass that on to him. <laughs> uh, CrossFit or Crossword? Uh, CrossFit. Really? Did you watch the World Games around at the weekend? Uh, I watched a little bit of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I uh, Crosswords are hopeless. Yeah, <laughs> well, look at what that answer was. That. Hockey or hurling? 
Hurling. Right, another Hurling good is answer. an amazing game. Talking to Quinny about Hurling, now Quinny, yeah. uh, and obviously he played GAA and he played Hurling as well. And he loved Hurling. Mm. And he said, you'd have loved it, Cammy, you mm. know. Great sport. Uh, in, your, in your prime because it was so competitive. Well, he has the right stature for it as well, you know. Oh, uh, in my prime, I'd, I'd have loved it. And, and uh, just watching, we, we actually showed a clip of Quinny involved in it on goals on Sunday. Right. Which was we managed to get. When he was a kid, was it? Was, it uh, was yeah, yeah, when he was playing in the All Ireland yeah, final. He played, exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly in Crow yeah, Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Raging Bull or Rocky? Um, Rocky. Oof. Rocky Balboa. Left field call there. Yeah, oh, Rocky Balboa, yeah, yeah. No, it's got to be in Sylvester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sly all day long. That's one of my ambitions is to run up those steps at Philadelphia. Really? Yeah, yeah it is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Got to do to get it. Get That's there, on my bucket list, yeah, yeah. Get there, do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I had this down before we started the conversation, right, so I'm not retrofitting this one. Big Sam or Garrett Southgate? <sighs> <laughs> it's got, I appreciate it for the reasons we've just discussed. Oh, Big Sam's, yeah, I, I talk to Big Sam more than I do Gareth, but I sent Gareth messages every, you know, not every day, but nearly every other day while he was in the World Cup wishing him well. And, yeah, you know, I, t I did that to quite a few of the players as well because I just thought, you know, they've got so much time on their hands and, you know, let them know how well they're doing because I know um, th that the boredom can set in when you're, mm. that you're away from that amount of time with the players, but... Uh, no, Gareth just behind, but uh, you know I was obviously instrumental because Steve Gibson's my mate at Middlesbrough. You know, making the decision on getting him the job at Middlesbrough right. didn't, wor didn't work out great for him, but uh, you, you know he, he, he might be born to be the England manager. You know, you know yeah. yeah. You helped advise. Well, yeah, Steve and I talk, you know, Steve Gibson, the borough chairman, and I went to school together from the age of five until right. we were 15. Right. So we always look out for each other. And I played for Middlesbrough when he was the chairman, uh, and we always said one day that I would manage the club. That's never going to happen now, um, and he would be the chairman. It's not going to happen. Uh, and so we, you know, we chat from time to time about the managers that he brings in and and everything else like that. And one of those at the time, Gareth was just ready and ripe to go, to go into it and um, didn't work out great for him. No, it didn't in the end. Who's In a word or two words, who's going to win the Premier League this season? Um, I don't know, to be fair. I, I really don't know. Yeah. I, you know, like I said, Liverpool look to have their best chance. Yeah. But they, it really does depend on Salah. If Salah has the same season that he had last season and the goalkeeper performs, the new goalkeeper yeah. and the midfield player, you know, if that means Jordan Henderson is not going to get a game, possibly, um, then they could be a, a real threat. That's with Pep Guardiola already saying that um, the Champions League is his priority. If Manchester United have got problems, if Spurs not bringing in players, causes problems. Emery taking over from Arsene Wenger doesn't quite work because that might just take off because the players have been listening to the same voice but all of a sudden a fresh voice in the dressing room might make a world of difference uh, with them. Um, I know if I missed out, it must have been someone else. City, obviously, I don't know if we touch on them. But, I mean, yeah, just well, I mentioned them because their priority is... Yeah. Um, is the um, Champions League. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. We'll, we shall see what happens. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, it's a pleasure. Please send my best to Johnny Giles. We, we will do and, that. Uh, tell him, to, tell him uh, I'd love to see my hero again. I, it, it was a thrill for me when I was at Portsmouth. Um, Johnny Giles was player manager of West Bromwich Albion. And I played up front with George Graham because I was scoring loads of goals for the youth team then uh, at Portsmouth. And Ian St. John needed goals and um, George Graham had just signed from Manchester United they swapped him with a fella called Wynn Davis and if you remember oh, I didn't think about not, not Wynn Davis the other Davis uh, anyway yeah. um, Ron Davis right. Ron Davis his name was um, we swapped him with him and uh, so I played up front alongside George and uh, and I remember watching uh, Johnny Giles that day and he was magnificent you know already got a pass in his head before the ball even came to him 
uh, and we lost to the big centre half called John Wilde kicked me all over the park. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a regular thing, Chris. To be fair, that's, uh, yeah. Look, we, 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 I'm up for trying so, to make that heroes video happen. So tell Johnny Giles, was, was it his idea for John Wilde to yeah. kick me all over the park? The bomb kicking, you can be damn sure it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks a million for coming in. Real pleasure, pleasure catching you. up with you. Uh, Sky Sports, of course, the best place to see uh, Premier League action this season. 159 live matches, including Saturday's uh, three o'clock kickoffs, uh, exclusive to Irish viewers. The first 31 fixtures is going to kick off on uh, Friday night. It's Manchester United up against. Leicester. City. OTB AM. Thanks to Screwfix.ie. Championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products.